What's up guys? It's your boy, Omni-sensei. Welcome to, What if I was reborn in Naruto as Branch Yuga? Becoming a Villain, Part 6. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story, link in the description. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. Even in winter, the land of rain doesn't snow. At the start of winter, freezing cold rain falls, forming a thin, transparent layer of frozen ice on the ground and trees. Everywhere, the ice is light red, frozen with the blood of shinobi. In life, they fought each other. In death, their blood mixed together. Perhaps the peace among shinobi can only be realized in the afterlife. Late at night, in the Kanoha camp in the land of rain, Yudo sat by the stove, warming himself. Shinobi need to eat and dress, and in cold weather, they often use chakra to generate heat by stimulating their cells. Of course, as the deputy commander, Yudo lived comfortably even on the front lines. Kanoha provided him with good living supplies. He tossed a potato into the stove, sending sparks flying. He then added many meat and spice balls. These were similar to MRE from his past life. They needed only heating. The logistics team knew Yudo's cooking was as bad as being sealed by the four symbols seal, so they specially prepared some semi-finished meat and vegetable balls for him. When working late, he could just put them in the stove. The taste was decent, at least better than his own cooking. Knock, knock, knock. Someone was at the door. Come in, Yudo said without lifting his eyelid. Yudo Kuen, having a meal? Minato appeared, sitting by the stove. Minato Senpai wants some? Yudo offered. Sure. Minato smiled warmly. Let's eat and talk. After a while, when the MRE became ready, they ate directly around the stove. So convenient, Minato said, biting into a rice ball. I should ask the logistics team to prepare some for me too. I remember you cook well, and isn't Kushina Senpai there with you? We don't have much time. Minato shook his head. Speaking of serious matters, Yudo Kuen, the village wants you to return. Me? Is there a mission? The umbu who delivered the Hokage's order didn't say anything about missions. So, it should be a normal rotation. Yudo calculated the time and sighed. Indeed, it's time to return. The moon god encirclement battle had ended almost half a year ago. The shinobi world entered winter again, and year 57 of Kanoha was coming to an end. In less than a month, it would be the new year. Yudo had been in the land of rain for nearly nine months. Even as a vice commander, it was time to return to the village for rest. Yudo Kuen, don't worry about the Western Front. After you return, Jiraiya Sensei will take over. Is Jiraiya Sama's injury healed? Almost. Sensei can't stay idle. He has been soaking in hot springs in the land of hot water, saying it helps his mood and speeds up recovery, haha. <laughs> that sounds like Jiraiya Sama. Yudo paused and then said, Minato Senpai, I remember just now, you seem to have some special promotions slots? Those slots have been allocated to your three students. I reported them last week, Minato said sincerely. Ruri, Shursway, and Muta are all excellent kids. Thank you. Yudo sighed inwardly and handed Minato a piece of roasted potato. No wonder Minato could become Hokage. He worked tirelessly since the war began. He even steeped up to command when Orochimaru was in trouble. He is brimming with talent, and even understood how to comfort people and exchange benefits. The calls for Minato to become Hokage were growing louder. Both the higher-ups and Kanoha villagers, as well as the frontline warriors, all supported Minato unanimously. But speaking of which, Yudo Kuen, Minato said, blowing on the potato before eating it, what do you think of the Akatsuki organization? They're a major threat. With the Rinnegan and Wood release, they harbor extreme hostility towards the village. Yes, the Rinnegan is already frightening, and now there's also Wood release. Kitsu Yoshihiro, his fame is growing. Minato Senpai, Amage Cure and Akatsuki are significant threats, Yudo said, like a young, concerned protector of the village. Maybe we should launch a war against them. It's difficult. 
I've thought about using the Flying Thunder God to infiltrate, but Amage Cure is too closed off and mysterious. Minato suddenly smiled. Recently, some high-ups suggested using Jinchuriki to destroy Amage Cure. He was still smiling, handsome and gentle, but the smile was cold, suppressed with anger. Yudo raised an eyebrow, knowing that mentioning Kushina would anger Minato. Shall I look into who suggested that when I return to the village? Thank you, Yudo Kuen. The fire in the stove seemed even warmer. Exchanging benefits doesn't distance people but brings them closer. The two talked for a long time until the firewood burned out, and Minato finally left. Yudo leaned against the door, watching him leave. The Kanoha camp was busy as always. The boy watched the patrolling shinobi squad, the light in his eyes flickering. After the moon god encirclement battle, the land of rain entered a prolonged stalemate. The fire, earth, and wind countries fought each other. Although Amage Cure occasionally interfered, the overall situation was relatively stable, with major shinobi villages exchanging lives in a programmed way. Tsunade returned to Kanoha four months ago, ending their secret game. Yudo felt a bit regretful but quickly adjusted, planning to continue accumulating Hyuga corpses and making more gods' masks for emergencies. Unexpectedly, this plan hit a snag. The cause was still the moon god encirclement battle. The Hyuga clan contributed significantly to Haruzan's plan but received no benefit. A main family clan girl even went missing. To appease the Hyuga, the Hokage provided many resources and made certain policy concessions. One policy was to protect the Byakugan as much as possible on the battlefield, and any Hyuga member's disappearance must be formally reported by the battle's commander. The intent was to account for the Hyuga shinobis, to protect the village's Kekiai Genkai. But this policy troubled Yudo. If too many Hyuga went missing on the front lines, he and Minato would be questioned by the Hokage. A thorough investigation might reveal Yudo's betrayal. There's no wall without a crack. With enough effort and consequences, using impure world reincarnation to investigate could uncover most secrets in the shinobi world. So Yudo had to be extra careful, slowing down the collection of bodies. But even slowly, he could still collect some. Yudo had patience. Returning to the village, however, might yield nothing. He still needed two clones. The Uzumaki clone might be created using Nagato cells, but the single Sharingan's tissue wasn't enough to make an Uchiha clone. To achieve his goal, he had to use God's mask and his identity as the moon god. After thinking for a while, Yudo couldn't find a solution. Being stuck halfway was frustrating, but with the tightened Byakugan protection policy, he had to proceed cautiously. Since the outbreak of the Third Shinobi World War, Yudo, as a warrior on the front lines, had gained extensive experience. By the average survival time on the battlefield, he was undoubtedly a veteran. However, it was his first time leaving the battlefield as a vice commander. The next day, Minato called a small meeting with three vice commanders, including Yudo. Yudo will return to the village, and Jiraiya Sensei will replace him. Minato went straight to the point. This will be our last conversation as commanders of the Western Front. Yudo is going back to the village to report to the Hokage. If you have anything to say, let him convey it. Yudo, began the middle-aged Jonin from the Uchiha clan, please tell the village to be extremely cautious of the Akatsuki. The wood release belongs to Kanoha, but the Akatsuki has obtained it, which is a very alarming signal. Yudo nodded. I will request the Hokage to send more reinforcements. Before he could finish, another vice commander interrupted calmly, Vice Commander Yudo, perhaps you haven't understood Shin's point? Sonagekure and Iwagakure are strong, but unknown enemies are even more terrifying. With Shinosuke and Miko Hyuga missing, the incident regarding the Byakugan has been confirmed. Now, the Akatsuki has obtained wood release. If one day, the Sharingan stands against the village, I wouldn't be surprised. The young man was taken aback and glanced thoughtfully at Fujio Uchiha. The moon god had once raided Orochimaru's laboratory. In the ambush, Nagato appeared and destroyed the four Red Yang formation. The two must know each other. The appearance of wood release in the Akatsuki is related to the moon god. This inference was logical. The moon god killed many Hyuga clansmen and abducted Miko Hyuga. This was an undeniable fact. Would release be a Kugan. Two top-tier Kekiai Genkai of Kanoha had been acquired by the moon god. Next, could it be the Uchiha's turn? 
Even the most optimistic people couldn't deny this possibility. I understand, Yudo said solemnly. Vice Commander Shin, I will truthfully convey this to the Hokage. The Uchiha on the Rain Country Front need the village's support. This was Shin's true intention. The issues regarding Akatsuki is indeed difficult to resolve. Minato suddenly spoke. About that Kitsu Yoshihiro, everything is an unknown mystery. None of the Yenbi you sent to Amage Cure returned with information. They all likely perished. There seems to be a powerful perception barrier or ninjutsu around Amage Cure. It seems we are powerless against Amage Cure unless we launch a full-scale war. Yudo, convey my judgment to the Hokage as well. The only way to deal with the Akatsuki is to capture Amage Cure. Do not send Enbu on infiltration missions anymore. There's no need to waste the village's carefully nurtured forces. The four commanders discussed a few more things before parting ways. Yudo returned to his room, organized the intelligence and documents, and wrote notes for a smooth handover when Jiraiya arrived. He worked until dark, completing half the task. Just as he thought of taking a break, a knock sounded at the door. He opened it to find his three students standing outside. Come in, Yudo said, placing some snacks on the table. Sensei, sure sway bit into a sweet pastry. We heard you're returning to the village. You all seem well informed, Yudo ruffled his hair. When Jiraiya-sama arrives for the handover, I'll leave. Sure sway looked a bit shy. Sensei, can we go back to the village with you? Do you miss someone in the village? A girl maybe? Yudo teased. No, not really. Sure Sway, quick-witted, pulled the white-haired girl beside him in front of him. It's Ruri. She wants to see her home again. Ruri gave Sure Sway a sideways glance and stomped on his foot. Hearing his low cry of pain, she was satisfied and spoke up, Yudo Sensei, please take us with you. Her clear voice and lazy tone were typical of a girl acting spoiled. You're really committed to the act? Yudo thought to himself. Ahem, as Kanoha Shinobi, Fighting for the village's interests is our duty. Since the Hokage has given orders, we must obey. He paused, smiling at the handsome boy. Sorry, sure sway, maybe next time. Sure sway was a child with a broad view. Though he wanted to return to the village, he obediently refrained from further entanglement. The three students asked for guidance on their training, and Yudo answered each question, assigning homework to test them the next time they met. By the way, Ruri, while explaining a certain jutsu principle, Yudo casually said, Though Shur's way is strong, you're older than the two of them by a few months. As their older sister, take care of Shur's way and Muta, especially Shur's way, as the Uchiha are anxious due to the Moon God's incident. Yes, Sensei, Ruri responded softly. She understood his true meaning. Take care of Shur's way. For those Kotoamatsukami eyes, the false emotions and the supposedly harmonious Team 9 were actually just a training ground for the Shikatsu Miyaku and an eye cultivation chamber. Team 9's three kids left late at night, and Yudo leaned against the door frame, watching them depart. The boy and girl's movements and voices were faintly audible in the night wind. Ruri, why did you step on me just now? I didn't step on you. I stepped on a pig. Huh. Idiot, who told you to use me as a shield? If you miss someone in the village, just say it. I don't. You don't? Ruri suddenly leaned in close. Her long eyelashes fluttered as she spoke. You don't? Then why is your face red? Why are you sweating? The girl was so close, without any awareness of gender boundaries. Shursue's nose almost touched her fair face. His face turned bright red, and he instinctively stepped back. It's not red, and I'm not sweating. It's just leftover from the water release. The girl laughed. Water release? Can you do a waterfall jutsu? Show me. She leaned in even closer, finally giving up on logic. The girl merrily stepped on his foot and he just helplessly watched. The Uchiha boy, whose body flicker technique far exceeded Jenin level, didn't dodge. In the distance, Yudo sighed, holding his forehead. If he couldn't see through Shursue's little thoughts, he wasn't fit to be a spy. Shursue, you're really something, messing around in front of your teacher. Who taught you that? Jiraiya and Yudo were not very familiar with each other. Throughout the war, they often fought on different fronts, rarely meeting. Their interaction was quite formal and businesslike. Yudo organized the collected data methodically, and Jiraiya, without any airs, accepted it harmoniously. As their meeting concluded, Jiraiya felt a bit weary. 
He stretched, walked outside, and leaned on the railing, gazing into the distance. His broad back and wet white hair clung to his clothes, making him look like a solemn statue. Yudo Kuen, Jiraiya suddenly spoke, How's your sensei doing lately? She's in quite a good mood. Yudo thought about the secret games with the blonde woman. Even the briefest touch between them, as fleeting as it was, Yudo's Byakugan could capture the faint blush that spread across Tsunade's delicate skin. Actually, she's in a very good mood, Yudo added. Jiraiya sighed, You've had a tough time, Yudo Kuen. Your sensei is strong, but she also needs care. When you return to the village, please convey. Oh, never mind. Don't pass on any message. Happiness is not something a woman should seek. Jiraiya shrugged and continued staring into the distance. In that direction lies Amage Cure. Perhaps Nagato is watching us too? Yudo Kuen, you have met Nagato and even delivered messages for them. Do you think we ever had a chance to avoid this conflict? Yudo stepped forward, also letting himself get drenched by the rain, but said nothing. Jiraiya fell silent again. He didn't expect Yudo to console him. As one of the legendary Sanin, Jiraiya knew that the chances of reconciling Kanoha and Akatsuki were slim. Nagato, are you the child of prophecy as the Toad Sage foretold? Perhaps the current you will drag the shinobi world into the abyss? Jiraiya kept staring in the direction of Amigekure, his gaze unwavering. Yudo donned a raincoat and left the Kanoha camp. In six hours, dawn would break. By then, he would lead the wounded and a group of battle-worn shinobi back to the village. After the moon god encirclement battle, the shinobi secretly spying on him gradually withdrew. Today, Jiraiya officially took over as deputy commander, allowing Yudo to relax and handle his personal affairs before leaving. He wore his raincoat, walked through the frost-covered forest for a long time, taking a detour to the agreed location. Kitsu Yoshihiro was already waiting there. You are too flamboyant, Yudo said, rubbing his forehead with a wry smile. Yesterday, I received a battle report saying you used your jutsu to skewer Kanoha and Suna Shinobi like candied fruits, turning the place into a bloodbath. Kanoha is planning an attack on you. Be careful. I know what I'm doing, Kitsu replied nonchalantly. He looked like a 13 or 14 year old boy with a gentle appearance but aggressive actions. Such provocations won't be tolerated by the major shinobi villages. They will come to kill me. When that happens I'll just slaughter them all. With Nagato covering me, I can quickly grow in battle, reaching the level where you can devour me. You really want me to devour you? Every moment, every second. Why? Yudo was curious. Why? Kitsu Yukihiro was stunned for a moment, frowning. If you ask me why, I don't know. Think about it. Even if someone doesn't know the meaning of life, they wouldn't commit suicide for no reason. Living is the meaning. The meaning is living. Do you understand? I am incomplete. To me, nothing is more meaningful than growing quickly and being devoured by you. Yudo was suddenly flattered. I didn't expect my status to be so great in your eyes. Kitsu rolled his eyes. Thanking me is as pointless as bowing to your own pinky finger. Ha ha. Yudo laughed and advised, I just wanted to tell you to be cautious, but since you have a plan, I won't interfere. Don't be too optimistic, main body, Kitsu said softly. My ultimate goal is to be successfully devoured by you. I don't care about anything else. No matter how big the trouble, I don't mind. At least, that's what I think. Yudo waved his hand and turned to leave, as long as you know what you're doing. Who knows when we'll meet again? Take care of yourself. I hope next time we meet, you'll devour me. After parting with the Senju clone, Yudo went to the underground base alone, organized the experimental potions and materials, cleaned the floor and walls, and sprinkled desiccants and insect repellents. Finally, he moved the medical tanks containing Miko and Shinosuke to the Shikatsu forest for easy access. Due to the creation of the Senju clone and Kanoha's enhanced protection of the Byakugan policy, he had only obtained three corpses of his clan's genin during this period. He couldn't make the god's mask and had to put it aside for now. After finishing everything, Yudo returned to the Kanoha camp as dawn approached. He lay down for a short while before Minato Namikaze and Kushina Uzumaki arrived. Yudo Kuen, Kushina handed him a package, these are sweets and trinkets I collected in the Land of Rain. Please give them to Tsunade-sama. Sure. Minato Namikaze put his arm around Yudo's shoulder, smiling as he turned back. I need to have a word with Yudo Kuen. 
Then he pulled the white-eyed boy into the room, whispering mysteriously, Yudo Kuen, I have a favor to ask. Minato Senpai, just say it. I plan to marry Kushina. Huh? Oh, that's great news. A battlefield wedding? Yes, Kushina often comes to my command office. As a man, letting this ambiguous situation continue would be irresponsible. Minato's blue eyes flashed with anticipation and happiness. According to the traditions of the Land of Fire, we will invite a female companion and a male companion. Kushina will write to Tsunade-sama about this. And for the male companion, I want you. Suddenly, Yudo felt a bit complicated. In Minato's eyes, am I already someone he can discuss such matters with? Thinking it over, although Minato was popular in the village, he had no true life and death friends. No one had ever put the user of the Flying Thunder God in mortal danger. Yudo was Minato's direct subordinate, having followed him from the eastern to the western front. Moreover, he would be fifteen in a few months, barely suitable in age. There really wasn't a more fitting person in Kanoha. All right, Minato-senpai, Yudo nodded, hesitated for a moment, and softly said, May you always be together. The day Yudo returned to the village was very cold. The village didn't organize a public welcome. The shinobi returning from the western front directly went to the Hokage's office to report, were reassigned, and then rested, preparing for the new year. As the vice commander, Yudo naturally had to meet the Hokage first. In the office, Hiruzen Saratobi stood by the window, his figure surprisingly stooped. Time had finally begun to take its toll on this ninjutsu professor. His beloved student's departure from the village, the successive battles, and the pressure to suppress the unruly shinobi clans. By the second year of the shinobi world war, Hiruzen's hair had turned significantly gray. Yudo, the Hokage said without turning, taking a drag from his pipe, how's the front line? Yudo relayed the message from Shin Uchiha, Hokage-sama, the troops in the land of rain are fine, but Uchiha seems very worried about the moon god. The moon god, huh? He's indeed a troublesome fellow. First the Byakugan, then the wood release. One day, he'll probably target the Sharingan too. Uchiha's concern isn't unfounded. Hokage-sama, because of the moon god, the Kekiai Genkai families on the front line are in a state of anxiety. My eyes see fear in the warriors facing imminent death. They might not fear death, but no one can calmly face the executioner's blade hanging over them. Hearing Yudo's words, Hiruzen fell silent for a moment before asking a strange question, Yudo, you haven't returned to the clan compound, have you? No, Hokage-sama. I came here first. You can go back now. Yes, Hokage-sama. Yudo left the Hokage's office, a bit puzzled. Was Hiruzen angry? What did I say wrong? That shouldn't be. However, just as he was turning to leave, the Hokage's voice suddenly echoed in his ear. Come back here at three in the morning. Avoid everyone. Maybe then you'll understand why I called you. Though confused, Yudo still left the Hokage's office after bowing. He first went to greet Tsunade, and then returned to the Hyuga clan compound. The compound was still orderly. With the clan's strict hierarchy, there was no chance for it to be lively. Strict and ancient, like a decaying old tree, most of the time, the compound was eerily quiet, as if no one lived there. However, because of Hiruzen's words, Yudo carefully observed his clan members and noticed an undercurrent of excitement beneath the oppressive atmosphere. Excitement? Yudo frowned. Was it because of the village's intensified Byakugan protection policy? The thought crossed his mind, but he dismissed it as unlikely. Overthinking was useless. Yudo shook his head and returned home, planning to ask the third Hokage for clarification at three in the morning. However, as the sun set, Hayashi Hyuga sent someone to tell him to meet. With thoughts of I'll gouge out your eyes in a couple of years, Yudo respectfully followed the messenger to the clan leader's room. Come closer, Yudo Kuen. Hayashi gestured to the tatami in front of him. I have something to ask you. Yes, clan leader. Yudo sat down near Hayashi hearing the heavy wooden door being shut tightly behind him. Inside, Hayashi, wearing a white cloak, looked at Yudo with something burning deep in his eyes. Have you fought the moon god? Yes, but I was no match for him and was defeated almost instantly. Does the moon god's style really have traces of gentle fist? Yes, Yudo knew this couldn't be hidden. He habitually relaxes the joints in his fingers when he speaks, starting with the ring finger and ending with the thumb and pinky. 
This is a habit formed from years of practicing gentle fist. Hayashi's clenched hand tightened, his gaze growing hotter. Yudo Kuen, do you think Miko is dead? Clan leader, I'm not familiar with Miko sama. Just tell me your thoughts. I believe Miko sama is not dead. If he wanted to kill, the moon god could have killed any of us in that forest. But Miko sama just disappeared, and there were no signs of a battle at the disappearance site. Just as I thought, the moon god is a Hyuga clan member and captured Miko. Could he really be Shinosuke? Hayashi closed his eyes, saying something that shocked Yudo. There's over a 90% chance he is Shinosuke. The clan will contact him. Solely representing the will of the Hyuga. Yudo narrowed his eyes, reacting as befitting his position, clan leader. He stood up, looking at Hayashi in disbelief. Collaborating with the enemy. Are you planning to defect? Don't put it so harshly. The Hyuga will always be loyal to Konoha and the Hokage. We won't betray the alliance formed at the village's founding. However, contacting a lost child is also my duty as clan leader. The two pairs of pure white eyes stared at each other. Slowly, Yudo lowered his head. But, clan leader, the moon god is an enemy the village wants to kill. Shinosuke is a Hyuga, and a member of the main family. Hayashi's tone suddenly turned serious. Clan first, then the village. Yudo took a deep breath and said no more. He understood the reason behind the excitement in the compound. After capturing Miko, the idea that the moon god is Shinosuk was almost certain. For the Hyuga clan, this was undoubtedly good news. The Akugan could gain new power in some way, just like the Sharingan. Yudo, even if we don't act, the village will. Hayashi softened. Shinosuk didn't kill Miko, proving he hasn't severed his past ties. That means there's room for negotiation. If there's room for negotiation and a deal to be made, the village's bargaining chips will always be greater than the clan's. After all, if Shinosuk wants the Sharingan, it would be hard to get from within the clan. Yudo you're smart. For yourself and for the clan, from now on, you must monitor the actions of the Hokage's office. After all, you are a trusted member of the teacher-student line. They trust you. At three in the morning, the temperature in the snowy night was lower than during the day. Yudo put on another layer of clothing before heading to the office as agreed. Inside, Hiruzen stood by the window, seemingly unmoved all day. Yudo, unlike other young shinobi, you always manage to think on a higher level. He got straight to the point, I know deep down, you prioritize the village over the clan, and once called the Jewel of the Hyuga, you are deeply trusted by the main family. So, from now on, you must monitor the actions of the Hyuga clan. Feeling the office was too stifling, Hiruzen and Yudo silently stepped outside, standing on the rooftop of the Hokage building. The night breeze blew gently. Yudo knelt on one knee, head lowered, not saying a word. Yudo Kuen, the third Hokage side, the village might be on the brink of destruction. Hokage sama. Yudo Kuen, listen to me. Hiruzen pointed towards the Hokage rock in the distance. Fifty years ago, with the Senju and Uchiha clans at the core, Many powerful shinobi clans gathered and established the one village, one nation system. Although the ninja academy has produced more and more core strength, we must never lose our kekiai genkai to protect the village. Unity, casting aside hatred, this is the will of fire. But now, the Hyuga are doing things contrary to the will of fire. Yudo Kuen, how does it feel to return to the Hyuga clan? Hokage-sama, the clan seems, happy. Of course they are happy. Hiruzen sighed helplessly, the likelihood of Moon God being Shinosuke is over 90%, and his abilities are very similar to those of the Akatsuki member with the Rinnegan. The Byakugan can evolve. It's not just the Hyuga, even other high-ranking members of Konoha think so. New powers, new dojitsu, no shinobi can resist this temptation, especially the gradually declining Hyuga clan. Hokage-sama. Yudo spoke timely. Positioned as a genius of the Hyuga clan who cares about the village but also loves his family, it was impossible for him to remain silent. To express his emotions, he deliberately sped up his speech. The clan head would never betray the village. I believe in Hayashi, but as the Hokage, I must be prepared, Hiruzen said calmly. Yudo Kuen, two years ago, when Tetsuro Sujiura died in battle, you said you wanted a reward that everyone in the village would be satisfied with. At that moment, I realized you had already broken free from the shackles of bloodline and could think from the perspective of the whole village. 
Yudo Kuen, nearly three years have passed. You have transformed from the jewel of the Hyuga into the lone lion. Now, tell me, have you wavered in your answer? After a long silence, Yudo replied with a bitter voice, My answer will never change. Hokage-sama, I will monitor the clan members. Hiruzen patted his shoulder comfortingly. Things haven't reached the worst point yet. The Hyuga may do something extreme for the method to evolve the Byakugan, but Hayashi wouldn't easily gamble the fate of the entire clan. I absolutely trust him on this. I just want to gather as much information on the Hyuga as possible. This is to protect the village and to protect the Hyuga. Even if there is conflict, the village and the Hyuga must remain honest with each other. Avoid misunderstandings, prevent strategic misjudgments. So, Yudo Kuen, you are the bridge of peace. Yudo almost laughed out loud. This is the first time I've heard of someone using a powder keg as a bridge. Time flew by, and Yudo had already been in the village for half a month. The village hadn't assigned him a new position, allowing the branch family member to live quite a carefree life. No missions, no piles of official duties to handle, every day was just training in the Senja clan grounds, drinking tea after getting tired, watching the sunset with Tsunade, and waiting for a new day. One afternoon, 20 kilometers outside Kanoha, in a certain mountain forest. Boom. A huge rock fell to the ground. Yudo dodged it, veins bulging around his temples, his vision extremely wide. Ha! Huh. Tsunade's voice rang in his ear, followed by a foot landing squarely on Yudo's shoulder. He didn't dodge. Instead, he supported the foot with both hands, enduring the heavenly foot of pain. Both he and Tsunade exerted their monstrous strength, their bodies quickly sinking, crushing the low mountain beneath them. Revolving heaven. Due to his age and training duration, Yudo's absolute strength was not as great as Tsunade's. As he was about to be overwhelmed, he spun rapidly, using the unique defense technique of the Byakugan. Bouncing Tsunade away, Yudo swung his right hand, launching a lion's fong bite fiercely towards the blonde woman's abdomen. Tsunade didn't hesitate, gathering chakra and throwing a punch towards her student's head, a deadly exchange move. Although both had the creation rebirth, as a descendant of both Senju and Uzumaki, Tsunade's vitality was ten times greater than Yudo's. The best strategy was to trade blows and fight to the death. Boom. Boom. Two gusts of wind erupted in the collapsing, shattered forest as master and student stopped simultaneously. The fists containing immense strength stopped just short of each other's abdomen and forehead. Not bad Yudo, Tsunade sighed, rubbing her shoulder. Your taijutsu has improved. Combined with the explosive tag multiplication, Byakugan, and your self-created lion's fong bite, you can now rival Jiraiya and Orok. Her eyes dimmed. Oomph. Even saying that bastard's name might bring bad luck. Sensei, where did Orochimaru-sama went to? Yudo asked curiously, panting heavily. I remember he appeared in the Land of Rain during the ambush on Moon God as one of the four Red Yang Formation users. He ran away, of course. Don't be fooled by his cold demeanor. He's actually the most cowardly and afraid of the old man. When he made mistakes as a child, he would hide in the woods playing with snakes and only come back when it was dark, Tsunade said with a huff. I never thought Orochimaru-sama had such a past, Yudo chuckled. Just as he was about to say more, a clear shout came from a distance, Tsunade-sama, Yudo-san, you two have messed up the terrain again, really? The village elders are going to nag again. Thirteen-year-old Shizun approached, carrying a lunchbox. She was a year younger than Yudo, and had already grown into a beautiful young lady. Tsunade shrugged nonchalantly. There's no one here. What if the village had set up alert devices and traps here? Tsunade-sama, can you and Yudo-san restrain yourselves during training? Shizun pouted, not daring to get angry at Tsunade, and instead glared secretly at Yudo. He didn't mind, extending his hand with a smile. Give me the lunchbox, I'm hungry. I'll train for a few more hours. Sensei Shizen, you two go back first. No way, ouch. Tsunade, knocking Shizen's head lightly and handing the lunchbox to Yudo, we'll leave first. Shizen, Yudo still needs to finish his gentle fist training for the day. Learn from your sensei, Shizen. This is what a mature kunoichi does, Yudo said with a smile, taking the lunchbox. He discreetly scratched the blonde woman's palm in the process. Tsunade's expression remained calm, still smiling as she talked with Shizen, though a fine sweat seemed to form on her neck. 
Watching them walk farther away, Yudo opened the lunchbox and ate everything inside, then activated his Byakugan to check the surroundings. He then used a summoning jutsu, slipping a piece of paper into a slug's body. Give this to Kitsu, Yudo whispered. On that white paper, a sentence was written in English. Regarding Moon God's whereabouts, a tale can be revealed. Yudo, a familiar voice echoed as Yudo opened his eyes to see a blonde woman entering the room. Someone from the Hyuga clan is here for you, Tsunade said, glancing at her student's chest and handing him a white kimono. Get dressed. Yes, sensei. Yudo got up and checked the time. It was 2.30 in the morning. Even in the village of Shinobi, this was a time for absolute rest. What's high is she up to at this hour? Tsunade yawned, clearly irritated. This is exhausting. Something might have happened, sensei. Did we wake Shizen? No, once Shizen's asleep, she sleeps like a log. Ha ha ha. Yudo's eyes showed a hint of amusement. He dressed quickly, grabbed his shinobi gear, and left the house. Outside the gates of the Senju compound, a Hyuga Chunin waited. Yudo-sama, the clan head requests your presence. Understood. Yudo waved his hand and followed the clansmen through several streets to the Hyuga compound. The central house flickered with the light of dozens of candles placed in various corners, casting a shadowy, eerie glow on the wooden furniture. Yudo knelt on one knee, alongside other important clan members, waiting for Hayashi Hyuga to speak. We found traces of the moon god. Hayashi's first words sent a shockwave through the room. Though the Hyuga clan had long sought to find Shino Sokyuga, the so-called moon god, and the secret to evolving the Byakugan, the moon god was elusive. Finding his trace was an incredibly difficult task. Moreover, even if Shinosuke was indeed the moon god, having killed so many Konoha shinobi, who could guarantee he wouldn't attack his own clan? After the Hyuga clan set a plan to secretly contact the moon god, it didn't take long for them to achieve such promising result. Anyone with a brain would think this might be a trap. The information comes from the land of rain, Hayashi continued, ignoring the reactions below. A bounty station there received a visit from a person wearing a Hanya mask. Nowadays, few dare to wear such masks because of the moon god. Clan head, an elderly Hyuga member questioned, bounty stations have rules to protect their clients' privacy. Their information might be false. It's not, Hayashi replied. The moon god once deceived the bounty station in the land of hot water. Although he can still trade there, the station will no longer conceal his whereabouts. Hayashi paused and produced a prepared scroll. Besides the bounty station, there are other witnesses. Everything is detailed in this report. Yudo scanned the scroll. The first line read, A spy within the Akatsuki has leaked information. The moon god is suspected to be heading to the underworld. A smile played on Yudo's lip. He knew this must be the handiwork of the Senju clone. It had been five days since Yudo sent a message to Kitsu via a slug summon. Kitsu, being a decisive person, had likely leaked this information effortlessly, causing a stir with just a bit of news about the moon god. Wearing a Hanya mask in public would solidify the intel. After reading the report, most believed it to some extent. What troubled them was the kunai-shaped mark in the bottom right corner of each scroll, indicating the information came from the Enbu. The village was aware of the moon god's appearance at the bounty station. Don't worry about the village, Hayashi soothed noting the clan's concerns. The Hokage has decided to treat the moon god passively. Gather intelligence, be prepared, but do not engage. Many Hyuga exchanged glances, silently communicating. A fervent desire simmered in the room. As a powerful clan, the Hyuga had significant autonomy. To compensate for the losses from the moon god's ambush, Hiruzen Saratobi granted them many privileges. They had the capacity to dispatch forces outside the village, and the Hokage wouldn't object. But deciding who would go was tricky. Even if Shinosuke was the moon god, there was no guarantee of successful negotiation. Finding him could mean encountering deadly forces. I'll lead the team, Hayashi announced. To uncover the secret of these eyes, as clan head, I must go. Showing sincerity is key to negotiations. My life on the line should earn us at least a conversation. Despite the clan's protests, Hayashi calmly assigned the team. Rina, Harupiai Yuichi Yudo, he named several others. Besides Hayashi, only one elder was of his age. Meet at the village gate in half an hour, Yudo hurried back to the Senja compound to find Tsunade still awake, shaping freshly gathered snow. 
Back already? Tsunade glanced at him. Looks like you're heading on a mission? Yes, a clan mission. Yudo strapped explosive tags to his wrist for easy access. Bringing those? Is Hayashi hunting a tailed beast? It's a clan mission, Sensei. I can't say more. Yudo shrugged, adjusting his headband. Humph. Tsunade frowned, leaving the room but deliberately bumping Yudo's shoulder on her way out. Yudo didn't mind, continuing to prepare his gear. Once ready, he ran to the back mountain, leaned against a tree, and summoned a black rod, stabbing it into his chest. Blood splattered, but Yudo endured the pain, healing the wound with the mystical palm technique and wrapping it in bandages. Arriving at the village gate with five minutes to spare, he found the other Hyuga members already there. Despite the danger, the lure of evolving the Byakugan was irresistible. Hayashi glanced at the Hokage rock. They would either gain new power or face total annihilation. There was no middle ground. Although arrangements had been made, the loss of this elite group would still be a severe blow to the Hyuga clan. But there's no turning back now. With this resolve, Hayashi led the group into the forest, vanishing from Kanoha's outskirts. After leaving the village, Yudo's team swapped their standard green leaf village armor for the traditional white kimono of their clan, swiftly heading towards the land of rain. Since, he is traveling with shinobis with the Byakugan, Yudo made adjustments to the size of the black receivers, shortening them and increasing their number. This way, even if they were seen by the Byakugan, they would be mistaken for decorative items. In truth, Yudo knew this concern and preparation were somewhat unnecessary. When the Byakugan is activated, it doesn't passively see chakra-bearing life. It requires concentration of chakra in that direction. Within the Hyuga clan, using the Byakugan to see through another clan member's body is seen as provocative and rude. Given Yudo's current status, few would dare do so. They set off at 4 a.m., and by dawn, they had not yet reached the Fire Country border. It was winter, and the deep snow hindered their speed despite their shinobi abilities. Fear and excitement filled the group. The Hyugas were silent, releasing their emotions through running. This was an adventure. For the old and decaying Hyuga clan, only the young clan head, who was not yet 30, could take such an action. In a few years, the flames in his heart would be extinguished by the burdens of work and life, and he wouldn't risk this again. Time passed, and they got closer to the land of rain. Upon reaching the edge of the fire country, Hayashi Hyuga commanded his clan to stop and rest. Soon, a hooded man emerged from the forest. Hayashi-sama, he said respectfully, handing over a scroll. This is a route map drawn by the organization. It's based on speculation and may not be entirely accurate, but it should serve as a reference. Understood. Hayashi nodded slightly, and the hooded man quickly left without wasting any time. Yudo observed everything quietly, swallowing a soldier pill without drawing attention. The hooded man was a spy planted by the Hyuga clan at the bounty station, a precious pawn that only the clan head and a few elders had the authority to contact. The influence of the thousand-year-old clan extended beyond one village or country. After resting, the Hyugas set off again. The familiar humid air entered Yudo's nostrils as they reached the land of rain, and the black receivers embedded in his chest began to heat up. A few hours earlier, a coffin was buried in the land of rain by Kitsu. Kitsu had etched a blood contract on the summoning scroll in the Shikatsu forest. The slugs, as both main bodies and clones, served as indispensable transmission points for conveying information and items. Yudo's chakra flowed through the black receivers, causing the distant coffin to tremble. Soon, a figure in a black robe and a Hanya mask rose from the coffin. While following his clan in search, Yudo controlled the corpse, making it run towards the center of the Land of Rain, appearing to head for Amage Cure. The god's mask had been used up, and due to the Byakugan protection policy and his return to the village, it was difficult for Yudo to obtain another clan member's body to enter the mask mode. Fortunately, the Hyuga group did not want to fight. Considering the Moon God's formidable track record, Hayashi knew they wouldn't stand a chance. Clan head, a Hyuga Jonin suddenly exclaimed five minutes later. I see the target. At two o'clock, approximately 1,700 meters away, the Hyuga's breaths quickened as they changed direction, moving rapidly towards the target. Put away your weapons, remove your arm guards, and no one but me should activate the Byakugan. Slow down as we approach, Hayashi instructed. This was to show the moon god that they came to talk, not fight. 
For a proud individual, this was the most effective way to approach. The corpse, under Yudo's control, stopped moving and leaned against a tree, arms crossed, waiting. He really stopped. Hayashi muttered, suppressing his joy and fear. Less than two kilometers was nothing for the elite Hyugas. With anxious hearts, the group arrived before the Hanyamast figure. They did not spread out to encircle but stood in a line, with Hayashi at the front, heads slightly bowed, showing utmost respect. Hayashi took a deep breath and respectfully said, The Hyuga clan greets you, Moon God. Thank you for giving us the chance to speak. Although we are part of the Leaf Village, we have a degree of autonomy. Hayashi slowly explained, trying to distance the Hyuga clan from Kanoha, emphasizing that their involvement in the ambush was due to Haruzan's pressure, not their desire to oppose the Moon God. His words were well chosen, humble. If the person in front of them were arrogant, they might ridicule them. But as long as there was a response, Hayashi could keep the conversation going. However, the masked figure remained silent throughout. The tension grew, and many Hyuga's palms sweated. Hayashi was extremely nervous, fearing any wrong word would anger the moon god. He was seeking help and was at a complete disadvantage. Suddenly, Hayashi noticed something unusual. He had kept his head down, and when he glanced up and saw the moon god hadn't responded, he raised his head. A quick look revealed something odd. Compared to the night they raided Orochimaru's base, the moon god appeared much shorter. Today's strong wind blew the black robe, revealing an alluring curve underneath, hinting at a female body. Clan head, long time no see. The mysterious figure with the Hanya mask finally spoke, a girl's clear voice reaching the Hyugas, sending chills down their spines. She removed her mask, revealing a beautiful face. It was Miko Hyuga. In an instant, all Hayashi's doubts were answered. Why was the moon god seen this time? Why wasn't he using his flying technique? Why was he listening to Hayashi's long speech today? The answer was simple. The person wearing the Hanya mask was not the moon god. Miko wasn't dead and wore the Hanya mask, which meant there was no need to doubt the moon god's identity anymore. The moon god was Shinosuk, and he hadn't cut off all his human ties. Hayashi felt relieved. He knew at least today they wouldn't die. Miko grabbed a handful of snow and casually crushed it, then smiled. Clan head Sama, are you just going to keep staring at me? She appeared thin, as if she had just recovered from a serious illness, but her tone and expression were livelier than usual. Hayashi understood that Miko had likely resolved her inner conflicts through her time with Shinosuk, and she looked much better for it. There couldn't be a better outcome, Hayashi thought. Although Shinosuk is suspected to be the moon god, his extreme and forceful approach makes it difficult to extract the secrets he wants, and he could easily be silenced if he's not careful. Regardless, Miko would be much easier to talk to. Miko, Hayashi began, his voice gentle like a kind elder, if you have time, come home and visit. We have techniques to open the village's barrier without alerting anyone. Oh, and there are some gentle fist secret techniques you haven't learned yet. I'll give you a copy. Yudo nearly gave Hayashi a thumbs up. Without discussing conditions or benefits, he offered comfort and avoided sensitive topic. In Yudo's past life, this was akin to a young person working in a big city returning home for the holidays, with seniors not asking about work or marriage but instead stuffing them with affection. Given Miko's extreme romantic mindset, this strategy was spot on. Yudo carefully controlled his chakra as Miko's corpse fell silent, her eyes lowered as if in sorrow. Miko, Hayashi continued, seizing the moment, be careful out there, I am your elder, but also a shinobi of Kanoha. I can't disobey the Hokage's orders. The village is currently dormant, but as soon as the moon god shows a flaw, shinobi from the major countries will swarm like hyenas to blood. Shinosuk won't be defeated, Miko's corpse said softly, not hiding her affection for him. Don't underestimate the village, Miko, Hayashi said, finally hearing her call his name and feeling reassured. Last month's high-level meeting decided to freeze all operations against Shinosuk, but the Hokage has promised that if the plan to kill the moon god is reactivated, the village will use its greatest strength, including certain forbidden techniques. Forbidden techniques? Under Shinosuk's eyes, all techniques are ineffective. Ineffective? Miko, have you heard of impure world reincarnation? No. It's an evil technique that resurrects the dead from the underworld. Miko's corpse widened her eyes, 
nodding solemnly after a while. I understand. The atmosphere fell silent again, but this time, Hayashi held the initiative, showing concern for Miko, promising she could return home and learn the full gentle fist techniques, was playing the emotional card. Revealing that the village might use forbidden techniques against the moon god was a precious information card in a world where information is everything. Hayashi never worried about these words reaching the Hokage's ears. The caged bird seal restricted the branch family but also the main family's thinking. In a clan where oppression is a tradition, the idea of branch family betraying the Hyuga became a blind spot. And this was beneficial for the Hyuga clan, so Hayashi believed anyone but a fool would keep quiet. Miko's corpse seemed to sigh, glancing at Hayashi meaningfully. Hayashi's heart pounded. Everyone retreat for now. The Hyuga shinobi dispersed, stopping at least three kilometers away and staying on alert. Everyone understood that the upcoming secrets were for the clan head alone. In place, Miko's corpse brushed her hair aside. Clan head, our Hyuga bloodline flows with sin. Hayashi froze, not understanding her meaning. As thanks for the information you provided. I'll tell you about the original sin flowing in the Hyuga's veins. In the western outskirts of the land of sea, there is a type of shark. Female sharks give birth to 6 to 23 eggs. When the fetuses reach 260 millimeters, they move in the womb. The first thing they do is cannibalize their siblings, consuming them for more nutrients and space. The Hyuga clan is like these sharks. If we want power that rivals or surpasses the Sharingan, we have only one path. Consume our kind to evolve the Byakugan. Consume our kind to evolve the Byakugan. Hayashi's mind reeled. This clan head, not even 30 years old, understood why Shinosuke became the moon god. He must have killed branch family protectors, consumed their blood and power, and evolved his Byakugan. Hayashi's breathing became rapid. How do we? Don't ask any more, Hayashi-sama, Miko said softly. I don't know more. Hayashi felt a sinking feeling. For a thousand years, the Hyuga clan had made many efforts to evolve the Byakugan, but all had failed. But now, Shinosuke had succeeded. While validating the theory was gratifying, the most important thing was always the method. Unfortunately, Miko didn't know how Shinosuke did it. Hayashi couldn't let her leave without establishing a solid connection. He gritted his teeth, his mind racing, and then a thought struck like lightning. Wait, Miko! Hayashi called to her retreating figure. Even for Shinosuke, Hyuga clan members' bodies aren't easy to obtain, right? Yudo and Miko's corpse's lips curved slightly at the same time. The girl turned, eyeing Hayashi warily. Miko, Hayashi said, staring into her eyes, as the clan head, I know where the bodies of deceased Hyuga shinobi are stored or destroyed. Miko frowned, staying silent but seeming slightly relaxed. Shinosuke might be strong enough to attack the village. But why shed unnecessary blood if he can avoid it? The girl bit her lip. But, I can't decide for him. That's fine. If you trust me this once, next month at this time, this place, whether Shinosuke agrees or not, I'll provide what you need. Hayashi paused, then added his final push. Miko, Shinosuke's Byakugan has evolved, but yours hasn't. You don't want him risking himself for you, do you? Yudo exhaled slowly, watching Miko's corpse and Hayashi. The experiences as vice commander had taught him a lot. Yudo knew that sometimes, it's better to use others than to take risks yourself. Moreover, before the arrival of the bloody knight that severs everything, he would extract every bit of value. In pure world reincarnation, Hiruzen exhaled a ring of smoke. Hayashi is indeed very knowledgeable. In the night wind, the Hokage stood with his back turned, wearing his ceremonial robes, while Yudo knelt on one knee behind him. Hokage-sama, the clan head is just. Yudo hesitated for a long time before finally saying, he is just worried about our clan members scattered outside. Hiruzen chuckled. It's impressive that you could come up with such a reasonable excuse. Yudo lowered his head and remained silent, telling Miko about impure world reincarnation and then sending you away. Sai, Yudo-kun, this is what I was most worried about. Not knowing what they discussed can only lead to baseless speculation and distrust will grow from there. Fortunately, Hayashi is a very steady person and won't easily do anything detrimental to the village. Continue to monitor the Hyuga clan's actions, Yudokun. To make your work easier, you won't be assigned new duties for now. As for the reason, 
Hmm, I'll spread the word that you are about to become an advisor to the fourth Hokage. The new advisor should need ample time for independent learning, after all. By the way, Yudo Kuen, your appointment as the fourth Hokage's advisor isn't just a cover. Use this time to learn how to assist the Hokage in managing the village. You've served as a vice commander on the front lines. You have the ability. Yudo promptly expressed his loyalty. Hokage-sama, you are not old yet. No, I am old. Too old to suppress the Hyuga's unusual actions. Perhaps this matter should be handled by my successor. Hiruzen waved his hand. You can leave now. Contact me anytime if something comes up, and inform Minato about the Hyuga clan situation to keep him in the loop. Yes, Hokage-sama. Oh, dissatisfied with us leaving the village without permission? Hayashi took a sip of tea. Understandable. The Hokage must have guessed that we went to seek the moon god. But even the third Hokage couldn't know that this trip was very fruitful, even meeting Miko. Well done. Continue gathering information. However, Yuto Kuen, the clan leader looked at the branch family boy as if he were gazing at a great treasure. We're still having the same issue. You should settle down, marry, and have children. About that, clan head Sama, Yudo replied awkwardly, I might be entering the Hokage's building soon to study. The village seems to favor me as an advisor, so I might not have time to deal with my personal matters. Hayashi was taken aback, then smiled. That's good. Follow the village's arrangements. Indeed, it is a good thing. A spy in a high position will naturally gather more intelligence. Hayashi never considered the possibility of Yudo breaking free from control after gaining power. Lion's Fong Bite, Chakra Enhanced Strength, In Seal. No matter how many skills one possesses, a single activation of the Cursed Seal would cause even the fiercest lion to die on the spot. Yudo punched a large tree, causing the snow to explode into a firework-like shape. However, when he retracted his fist, the bark was intact. His gentle fist had reached a level where he could channel the force into the object's interior without using chakra, leaving the bark unscathed but shattering the core. Yudo was truly a year-round warrior, training whenever he wasn't bedridden. Yudo, a woman's voice came from above. Tsunade, smiling, sat on a tree crown and tossed him a gourd. In a few minutes, you can drink. In the ninja world, a 15-year-old boy is considered an adult. Sensei, Yudo shook the gourd. Why are you here? Where's Shizen? She went out to play with her friends. Honestly, you two are heartless enough to leave this old lady at home. You're not old. With the Ean Seal, you'll be as youthful as ever 20 years from now. The aging is in the mindset. The blonde woman sighed, tossing a snowball at Yudo. When Shizen left, do you know what I told her? Come back on time or no sweets for a week. That's what Grandma Mito used to say to me when I was little. Yudo laughed, jumping up to sit beside Tsunade on the tree crown. Sensei, what kind of liquor is this? Sakura Sake. That's strange. I've only heard of Sakura Machi. Ignorance is a sign of youth. Sensei, you'd be better off giving me a ninjutsu scroll or something. I'm not interested in alcohol. Even on New Year's Eve, I should be training. You're still too young to appreciate alcohol. And what kind of sensei I would be if I give you work as birthday gifts? That's not something a good sensei should say. Yudo laughed, slowly relaxing. For the upcoming new year, he had been anxious. Kanoha year 58 marked the end of the Third Shinobi World War. The Battle of Canopy Bridge had completely changed the world's course before then. A beetle would turn completely dark, following Madara's path to madness. In a year, he would even take advantage of Kushina's childbirth to kill his sensei and sensei's wife. Yudo wasn't sure whether to intervene. His courage was growing. With a clone with Hashirama cells, now, Yudo wanted to obtain Madara's cells. Not for any reason other than that the names Hashirama and Madara somehow sounded harmonious together. If he were to pursue this, it would be like pulling barbecue out of the fire with bare hands, risking great danger. Moreover, Madara, lurking underground, would likely know about the Moon God. His personality would make it unlikely for him to ignore the matter. He might strike at any time to capture someone with powers similar to the Rinnegan. Half of the four clones had been created. In a few years, their power would mature enough to break free from the cage bird, fulfilling a long-held dream. Using Madara's cells might speed up the process. The legendary ghost of Uchiha, barely surviving with the ghetto statue's support, 
had given his eyes to Nagato, leaving him at his weakest, even if it failed, there was still sure sway. It would just slow down the clone's growth a bit, if they shared the same fate and were consumed by their sensei, living together forever in one body, it would be a touching story. Right? As Yudo pondered, countless fireworks suddenly launched from the ground, ripping through the air with a sharp buzz. Various colors and shapes exploded against the black night sky, enveloping the two in an illusionary world. Happy New Year! Happy Coming of Age! The blonde woman suddenly shouted, opening the gourd of Sakura Sake, and pouring it into Yudo's mouth. The caged bird was now fifteen. Office of the Hokage. Yudo sat in the corner, holding a pen and paper, listening and writing, much like he did in meetings in his previous life. In the office, the top officials of Kanoha village were gathered. Hiruzen, the elder advisors, clan leaders, the heads of the Kanoha hospital, and the barrier team. Counting Yudo, there were a total of seventeen people. Suna is close to collapsing, Hiruzen said softly. You all saw the truce request they sent a few days ago. What are your thoughts? Let's hear them. Danzo immediately responded, we should cease the war with Suna. The puppet masters are difficult to deal with on the battlefield, and our troops struggle to penetrate that desert country. I agree, Fugaku sided with Danzo this time. Due to last year's rescue operation, Kumogakure is temporarily allied with us. If we appease Suna as well, Kanoha's only enemies left would be Kirigakure and Iwagakure. The former is leaderless, and only the latter is worth worrying about. We might be able to end the war this year. The top officials voiced their opinions, and the suggestion to end the conflict with Suna received widespread approval. This was the third year of the war, and everyone had lost friends and family on the front lines. Just last week, Fugaku held a funeral for his uncle. Hatred turned into numbness, and numbness into pain and exhaustion. The top officials of the ninja villages were not hidden politicians but shinobi who could join the fight at any moment, making them more aware of the horrors of war. All right, Hiruzen nodded. Let's have the Land of Wind submit a negotiation letter. Their new Kazakage is called, Raza? A fine young man, it takes great courage to bow one's head. The Hokage nodded to Danzo. Danzo, as usual, you'll draft the ceasefire agreement. Fine, Danzo replied with a cold smile. We'll have the Land of Wind provide war reparations and a certain number of puppet technique scrolls. The discussion about the ceasefire agreement with Suna quickly concluded, with high efficiency. All the officials didn't want to continue fighting with this desperate and impoverished enemy. With unanimous agreement, Hiruzen easily pushed it through. Agree to the peace negotiations with Suna and let Danzo Shimura draft the detailed treaty. Yudo wrote this down and continued to listen to the next topic. This was the third day of the new year and the first high-level meeting of Kanoha's 58th year. In recent days, Hiruzen had publicly praised Yudo in many settings as an indispensable right-hand man for the next-generation Hokage, even granting him the privilege to listen in and learn during high-level meetings. This wasn't a hint. It was a clear indication. Minato Namikaze will become the fourth Hokage, and Yudo Hyuga will be a core member of the new power structure. Everyone in Kanoha knew this within the first two days of the new year. With Orochimaru gone, and Jiraiya and Tsunade uninterested in the Hokage position, no one could compete with Minato. Therefore, the operation against the Moon God remains temporarily shelved. The last topic of the meeting concerned the Moon God. Out of caution, Hiruzen chose not to provoke them. Does anyone else have something to say? The Hokage asked, a normal procedure before adjourning the meeting. Hokage-sama, Yudo raised his hand, scratching his head apologetically. I have some thoughts. Yudo, feel free to speak your mind, Hiruzen encouraged with a smile. It's good that you have insights so early in your participation. Yes, Hokage-sama, Yudo turned and spoke softly. Elder Danzo, regarding the peace treaty you drafted, is the Land of Winds only price just money and puppet scrolls? Yes, Danzo frowned. The economy of Sunagakir is very underdeveloped. These demands are already a burden for them, as were the demands in the First and Second Shinobi World Wars. His tone was unpleasant. Yudo's first suggestion targeted his responsibility, making it seem like a deliberate affront, even if it was for public interest. Reparations are fine, but I think, instead of money, we should ask for a place. Where? Iron Foot Mountain, Yudo said calmly. It's on the border of the Land of Wind 
close to the land of fire. It has a high yield of special metals used for puppet joints. We take this mountain, making it harder for Suna to produce puppet. They would either have to spend time and effort finding other mines or buy from us. The officials paused, considering Yudo's suggestion. Impossible, Danzo shouted. Completely impossible. If we demand Iron Foot Mountain, Suna will refuse and continue fighting us. Then let them fight, Yudo said expressionlessly. We'll fight until Suna is completely destroyed. Everyone knows that with the Land of Wind's fragile economy, they will fall first. The new Kazakage is pragmatic. He will compromise. You, Danzo's expression changed. You're too extreme, Yudo. This isn't extremism. It's maximizing the gains from war. Nonsense, Danzo growled. This could lead to uncontrollable consequences. Absolutely not. Yudo nodded thoughtfully, then suddenly changed his attitude, sneering. So, such a proposal could lead to uncontrollable consequences. But Elder Danzo, your suggestion last month to release the Nine Tails Jinchuriki to destroy Amige Cure seemed like an irresponsible and extreme suggestion too. The office fell silent. The officials glanced at Danzo, then at Yudo, realizing Yudo's real intent was to reprimand Danzo. As for why he dared to challenge an elder so openly, everyone understood the reason. It was clear Minato heard something on the front lines and instructed this before leaving. He was risking his life on the battlefield, deterring enemies alone, while Danzo plotted to send his beloved girl to her death. Even a mild-tempered person like Minato would be furious. If his temper were worse, he might have used the Flying Thunder God technique to come and kill Danzo overnight. As for why Yudo stood up for Minato, it made perfect sense to everyone. Minato was expected to become Hokage this year, and Yudo, as his most capable and loyal subordinate, had to suppress the current advisors of the third Hokage. This was his duty, and also an unwritten rule in the village. Otherwise, Minato would become Hokage with no one listening to him, turning him into a figurehead, a colossal joke. The transition from old to new, the clash between factions, was, in a way, proof of Kanoha's thriving condition. Yudo Hyuga, watch your tone, Danzo said sternly, staring at him. Every decision made in this room must consider the bigger picture. Bigger picture? Yudo retorted, unfazed. The name Minato Namikaze is the bigger picture. Bang bang. Hiruzen Saratobi knocked on the table. Danzo Yudo, that's enough from both of you. Danzo gave Yudo a sinister look, but said nothing more. It was clear that such conflicts would continue to arise, especially when Minato Namikaze became the Hokage. The clash between the old and new orders would become even fiercer. Fortunately, these were just the growing pains of change. Hiruzen took a puff of his pipe, not planning to intervene too much, and waved everyone out of the office. Yudo left the Hokage building and went to the Senju clan's backyard. Using summoning Jutsu, he went to the Shikatsu forest. Miko's body floated in a preservation tank. Yudo carefully took it out and placed it on a wide tree branch, using skin restoration medical techniques to maintain the body. Being submerged in the preservative solution for a long time had discolored the skin. Anyone with a keen eye would notice something amiss. Yudo had to ensure Miko looked lifelike, preferably with a bit of a healthy flush. Miko's meeting with the Hyuga team occurred two weeks before the new year. According to the timeline, it was half a month until the transaction day he had agreed upon with Hayashi. Yudo hadn't heard any rumors, clearly indicating that Hayashi had kept the matter a secret, even from his own clan. This kind of unscrupulous act of digging up one's family graves certainly couldn't be publicized. After a long time, Yudo stopped and inspected Miko's body, nodding in satisfaction. The skin had been restored, and he had even added some subcutaneous fat. Miko no longer looked emaciated but rather plump. Before using the body next time, a bit of skin coloring would suffice. Where can you find a plastic surgeon with my aesthetic sense? Yudo muttered to himself, storing Miko's body away. A hooded man stood before a giant tree, opening a hidden mechanism and entering the trunk. A torch suddenly appeared, illuminating Hayashi Hyuga's face under the hood, casting shadows that made him look like an indistinct devil. The old man holding the torch chuckled eerily, his laughter grating and sounding like a broken-voiced night crow, perhaps from long isolation. Clan leader, have you reached the age of death as well? Don't joke around. I'm just here to take something and leave. This is the burial ground of the Byakugan. 
Besides me, only countless corpses remain. The old man was extremely ancient, his skin as wrinkled as decayed trees. Despite living in a subterranean tomb devoid of living companions, his mind was sharp as lightning. Clan leader, do you want the corpses of our clan members? Yes, Hayashi said plainly, quickly adding, as the clan leader. I have that right? Yes, clan leader, you certainly do. The old man turned and walked ahead with the torch. Follow me, clan leader. Don't look around or wander off. Countless eyes are watching us. Hayashi shivered involuntarily. In the boundless darkness, it did seem as if thousands of gleaming Byakugan were observing them. Due to the old man's extreme age, he moved slowly, almost like crawling. Hayashi followed, initially filled with anxiety, but gradually he calmed down, feeling almost reverent. Why is our clan's most important sanctuary built under this giant tree? And why are there so many wooden statues along the way? Hayashi asked in the darkness, confused. I thought I was heading to the Senja clan sanctuary. The old man laughed again. When I was very young, my grandmother told me, our Huga clan's ultimate destiny is closely tied to a tree. My grandmother was a rare kind of woman, strong and wise, surpassing most men in the shinobi world. She trusted her strength and disliked knowledge that transcended the realm of ninjutsu. Yet, she was deeply fascinated by this saying, often repeating it to me. What happened to her in the end? Hayashi asked softly. She died, killed by the wood release of the Senju clan, fulfilling that saying. Hayashi was silent. He knew that when the old man was active in the shinobi world, the shinobi village system hadn't been established. It was common for people of that era to be killed by the Senju. In their heavy, indistinct footsteps, they reached a broad platform. Countless coffins were inserted into the ground, each containing the body of a Hyuga clan member. Feel free, clan leader. Hayashi nodded and took out a sealing scroll, sealing thirty bodies into it. Done, Hayashi said, with hidden excitement in his voice. They retraced their steps, the old man still leading with the torch. Perhaps out of excessive happiness or some other reason, Hayashi suddenly asked, How is life in the tomb? The same. What do you mean, the same? Everything is the same, the old man said calmly without turning back. Outside, inside, it's all the same. Our Huga clan has been just a giant lifeless tomb. Ever since the caged bird seal appeared, Hayashi's voice turned cold. Are you questioning our ancestors' decisions? The ones older than me are all lying here. Even if I question, no one can refute me, right? The caged bird is a powerful protection measure, Hayashi scoffed. Because of it, the Byakugan doesn't fall into enemy hands, allowing our clan to stand proud for a thousand years. It is the blood bond of our clan. Bond. The old man was non-committal. Just now, you took thirty bodies, all branch members. Each coffin has a number indicating their date of death. All poor souls who died in the sixth to tenth year of Kanoha. If you ever met them, you should call them uncle or aunt. But you didn't hesitate or show any gratitude when sealing their bodies, like a foolish thief entering a treasury. Bond? What a laughable analogy. They didn't speak for the rest of the journey. Bang. The secret door opened again. Sunlight poured in as Hayashi walked out expressionlessly. The door slowly closed, isolating him from the old man once more. You are wrong. The caged bird is not wrong. The Hyuga clan's glory is built on this curse mark. As the door closed, Hayashi suddenly spoke. He heard the old man sigh. The mechanism locked, and the burial ground of the Byakugan once again sank into the earth. Hayashi stood for a long time until the dew fell on his eyelids jolting him awake. You are wrong, Hayashi muttered softly. As the last word fell to the ground, his figure vanished. You, once called creator of revolving heaven, are now just an old man. Continue to live as the pitiful tomb keeper. I am the one who is right. Days passed quietly. In the second week of the new year, as the weather slightly warmed, Yudo took on a mission. Even though he was highly regarded and undoubtedly a future right-hand man of Kanoha's Hokage, able to sit in on high-level meetings, he still had to fulfill his responsibilities as a shinobi of Kanoha. Kanoha, after all, was a top-tier violent organization with many rules and regulations, unlike the lax and sunny depiction shown in the manga. Even Tsunade had to meet the minimum attendance requirements at Kanoha Hospital. The mission Yudo accepted was simple to kill a rogue shinobi who had leaked information about the Land of Fire. 
Given his formidable combat abilities and Byakugan's tracking skills, it wasn't a difficult task, just time-consuming. Without dawdling, he packed his ninja tools and left the village. After traveling a certain distance, Yudo changed direction and headed towards the Land of Rain, periodically activating and deactivating his Byakugan to avoid any living beings. The day of his agreed transaction with Hayashi Hyugo was approaching, so Yudo had taken a mission that allowed him freedom of movement in advance. The risk here wasn't high, only Hayashi and Yudo knew about this corpse transaction, so there was no need to expend much effort to hide his departure from the village. The next day, Yudo entered the Land of Rain's territory and used reverse summoning to start coloring Miko's corpse, removing the pallor from her skin and adding a faint red hue to signify life. When the sun rose again, under Yudo's control, Miko's body slowly stood up, standing on a tree with her eyes closed, as if in a light slumber. Yudo then went to a hidden location two kilometers away to wait for Hayashi's arrival. As expected, the clan leader of the Hyuga clan appeared alone. At least he has some courage, Yudo thought, focusing his attention on Miko. The girl opened her eyes and softly spoke, You've come as promised, clan leader. Yes, Hayashi nodded, taking out a sealed scroll, the thirty corpses are here. All died within the last fifty years, and are well preserved. He paused, staring intently at Miko's eyes. Does Shinosuk know about this? Of course. And what did he say? In the Hyuga clan, there are few warriors like the clan leader. This is Shinosuk's exact words. Warrior, huh? Hayashi savored the word in his mind. Yes, I am indeed a warrior the one who will lead the Hyuga clan out of its predicament. He threw the scroll to the girl without discussing any conditions. Miko's body inspected the scroll and then tucked it into her clothes in front of Hayashi. Clan leader, we know what you want. You will get what you wish for. Exchanging corpses for the possibility of future transactions was the chip both parties offered today. Suppressing his inner joy, Hayashi's voice trembled slightly. So what is my cost? Only by giving up everything can you gain everything. Yudo controlled Miko's body and spoke thoughtfully. Thirty genin corpses could only make two god's masks, which was far from enough. The Battle of Canopy Bridge would take place in the spring, with a high chance of war breaking out. Moreover, making Uzumaki and Uchiha clones required two masks. The more god's masks, the better. He had to lure Hayashi in, making him willingly provide more corpses. A taste of the benefits was necessary. Give up everything, Hayashi said with difficulty, so Shinosuk paid such a heavy price. Clan leader, what you gain will definitely outweigh what you lose. Now, Shinosuk has those eyes, and I am by his side. Isn't that better than the days in Kanoha? Miko turned and softly said, I will bring gifts in our next transaction as well. In the damp and cold forest of the Land of Rain, Miko's body ran at high speed, with Yudo trailing far behind, controlling and contemplating simultaneously. He planned to head to a secret base in the Land of Rain with Miko's body, seal the girl's body, extract the Hyuga corpses, and use them to make God's masks. Given the mask creation cycle, it wouldn't be ready during his Kill the Traitor mission. He'd have to find another excuse to leave the village. Yudo rubbed his forehead, but just as he was deep in thought, a sudden sense of danger exploded in his mind, his nerves tensed instantly, and chakra roared through his chakra pathway. Far from his line of sight, Miko's body suddenly stopped. With Byakugan activated, the girl's clear voice echoed through the forest. Who's there? In the rustling sounds, a stranger stepped out from the shadows of the trees. He was tall, wearing a gray robe and a peculiar mask with a spiral pattern that only exposed his left eye. That lone eye was pitch black. After a brief silence, both the masked man and Miko's body moved simultaneously. Controlling a fellow clan member's body was second nature to Yudo. Miko was a main family lady with well-honed gentle fist techniques, and her chakra pathway were extremely familiar with this chakra movement method. Bang! Miko's body struck out with a palm, chakra bursting through the air, hitting the man with palm form. Eight trigrams palm rotation. A genius like Yudo, who could self-learn revolving heaven, naturally had long mastered the palm rotation technique. The man remained silent, agilely leaping away, as Miko's body threw a kunai, following it closely. The kunai missed, but the man's mid-air evasion left him unable to gain leverage again. They collided, and Yudo took a deep breath, unleashing the familiar gentle fist.
Bang 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 bang. The gentle fist, renowned as a secret close combat technique, excelled in short-range combat. As Hyuga's foundational skill, a set of gentle fist moves could severely injure even a tough-bodied Taijutsu shinobi. However, the man completely kept up with Miko's speed, handling her effortlessly, with his fingers, fists, and palms continuously clashing, completely suppressing the gentle fist. In a fleeting moment, the man reached out, bypassed the gentle fist defense, and grabbed the girl's collar. Revolving heaven, Miko's body spun rapidly, repelling the man. As the masked man landed gracefully, Yudo's brows furrowed tightly. A formidable opponent, pure gentle fist techniques are not enough, and his reactions are too fast. The gap was at most 1 20th of a second, yet he managed to seize it, such rapid movements and he could see them all? When the man looked up again, Yudo's thoughts momentarily stalled. Many questions were answered in that instant. The exposed eye had turned blood red, and within the cold, sinister gaze, three Tomo slowly rotated. Are you cosplaying as a Beto, that punk? Yudo suddenly felt like laughing. One Sharingan plus a spiral mask. Are you trying to be mysterious? However, Yudo knew that the person in front of him couldn't be a Beto. The Battle of Canopy Bridge hadn't happened yet, and Abito hadn't gone rogue. Moreover, the visible eye was wrong. Abito's was the right eye, this man's was the left. Who could it be? Yudo wondered, taking a deep breath. Since the Byakugan can't see through that mask, I'll just rip it off. In seal, release. He murmured softly. The diamond-shaped mark on his forehead vanished, and the chakra accumulated over time exploded, almost bursting through his chakra pathway. The black receivers began to vibrate unprecedentedly, and chakra surged from the ends of the black rods into Miko's body. The girl's blood vessels burst, her bones creaked, unable to withstand such immense chakra. A corpse should be used like this, Yudo's lips curled up, and at the same time, Miko's corpse smiled. 8 trigrams. Vacuum palm. The girl raised her hand and a tidal wave of force poured out. If the earlier strike was precise acupuncture, this one was a mountain crashing down. Even the best dynamic vision was useless as the man was sent flying, crashing through numerous trees. Miko's body was covered in blood. She stomped the ground hard and jumped above the enemy, delivering another vacuum palm, driving the man into the ground. Quit pretending, I'll tear off your skin. The girl's voice echoed through the forest as she fell, ready to use gentle fist techniques to cripple the man. At that moment, a kunai was thrown by the man, aiming for Miko's face. Struggling to the end, Yudo scoffed, controlling Miko to punch the kunai away. Bang! The impact was enormous, and even two kilometers away, Yudo heard it clearly. The girl was sent flying, blood splattering everywhere. What's going on? A special kunai. Yudo frowned, looking at his palm. From the feedback Miko's body gave, the reaction force felt like hitting a mountain. Meanwhile, the man stood up, dusted off his clothes, and raised his head. The Scarlet Sharingan had transformed. Three Tomo merged, lines intertwining like a blooming flower with three petals, each petal sensuously hugging the edge of the crimson eye, beautiful and dangerous. A mangekyo. Moreover, it was a pattern Yudo had never seen in his previous life. Are you kidding me? Yudo broke out in cold sweat. Besides Madara, Fugaku, Izuna, Abido, Shursue, Itachi, and Sasuke, who else had awakened the Mangekyo? Though the Uchiha clan had many branches and geniuses occasionally emerged, theoretically, there could be more Mangekyo users. But if there were, it should be from the Warring States period, not appearing before him now. Different minds, different eyes, different abilities. The power that altered the Kunai earlier must be from that Mangekyo. For a shinobi, information is a lifeline. Facing an unknown Mangekyo, the danger level skyrocketed. Run. Yudo considered this briefly. No. On second thought, this might be a great opportunity to test this unknown Mangekyo's ability. The worst case scenario is that Miko's body is completely ruined. In an instant, Yudo made a decision, and Miko charged again. Chakra poured out like there was no tomorrow. Three punches were thrown, followed by a Ian seal enhanced vacuum palm. The man didn't dodge, instead, he threw a few shuriken. Under some power's influence, they pierced through the vacuum palm and hit Miko's body. Revolving heaven, a spherical chakra shield appeared, catching all the shuriken. 
The force erupted, and Miko was sent flying, her body tearing through the ground. Her skin was shredded, clothes tattered, looking pitiful. However, from the two consecutive attacks, Yudo gleaned something. The ninja tools didn't change speed. What made them unstoppable was the sudden addition of terrifying weight. That Mangekyo's focus can briefly increase an object's weight by thousands of times. Yudo hypothesized. Having achieved his goal, there was no need to continue the fight. Yudo controlled Miko to limp away. The one-eyed masked man didn't pursue but watched the retreating figure thoughtfully. His objective was also achieved. In the dim underground, accompanied by light footsteps, the one-eyed masked man approached an old man. Madarasama, that woman indeed has black receivers. The man removed his mask, revealing a half-white face. White Zetsu, Madara Uchiha, eyes closed, remained seated, sustained by chakra from the demonic statue. Here you go. White Zetsu cheerfully handed over the Sharingan. Your Uchiha eyes are really handy, though they consume a lot of chakra. Luckily, my body's compatibility is high enough to turn off the Sharingan. Otherwise, I'd be drained before the fight even began. But, Madara-sama, don't blame me for being rude. Every time you make me take this eye out for a mission, your eye sockets are empty. Isn't that uncomfortable? Get a spare eye. Or do you have a cleanliness obsession? Madara took the eye, ignoring White Setsu's ramblings, skillfully connecting it with medical ninjutsu. After a while, Madara opened his eyes, speaking calmly. Unworthy eyes don't belong in my sockets, not even temporarily. So, you chose this eye carefully? Yes. Whose eye is it? Kagami. Uchiha, a junior of mine. Kagami Uchiha, a genius of the same generation as Haruzan Saratobi, awakened the Mangekyo on the day news of the second Hokage's death reached the village. As for why there were no records after he awakened the Mangekyo, why he died young at twenty-five, and how one of his eyes ended up with Madara while the other was taken by the Uchiha clan and later obtained by Yudo, it remains a complex, untold story. The real world is composed of countless unsolvable mysteries. Even true sages cannot know all secret. Kagami Uchiha. Was he strong? Probably. Hey, Madara-sama, what does probably mean? Either he was strong or he wasn't. Madara, as withered as old wood, spoke softly. If I remember the name, he was strong. But if I've forgotten his face, he wasn't that strong. Awakening the Mangekyo was merely meeting the criteria for Madara's memory. Eh. White Zetsu elongated his voice. Though occasionally annoying, his noisy presence was tolerated by Madara in this dark underground. Hey Madara-sama, who else do you remember as strong? Don't ignore me. White Zetsu grinned. How about Kakuzu, remember him? Who? Is that a human's name? Or a summoning beast's? Mere insects don't deserve a place in my mind. Ha. What about Anoki? He's not bad, he can stand at the same level as my feet. He only deserves to kneel before me. What about Tobarama Senju? Flying Thunder God, Impure World Reincarnation. Umph. He was full of little tricks, but he can see my knees. Though we are bitter enemies, he was indeed skilled. What about Ryasuki Hyuga? Ryasuki. If he were still alive, he'd probably be older than me. He deserves to be killed by my Rinnegan. Unfortunately, the Hyuga clan can no longer produce anyone with backbone. A true master, but still a notch below me. What an arrogant guy you are Madara-sama. White Zetsu scratched his head crazily, then thought of something and asked seriously. What about Hashirama Senju? The underground fell into a deathly silence. Hashirama, the god of shinobi from the Senju clan, the first Hokage, who fought me countless times. Hashirama Senju. The aged Madara leaned back in his chair, and just before closing his eyes, his voice resonated in the dark underground. The whole world was just our battlefield, nothing more. With a loud thud, a perfectly intact corpse appeared on the ground. Yudo flicked the ceiling scroll and nodded, the S-rank mission, the execution of the renegade shinobi, is complete. This is Goro Uchida. Please wait a moment, Yudo-sama, Two Chunin from the mission office respectfully nodded and took out tools to examine the body on site. Fingerprints, bone age, appearance. It is indeed Goro Uchida. The cause of death is a fractured cervical spine. As expected of you, Yudo-sama, your mission was executed flawlessly. The Chunin made a mark in the mission log and bowed. Thank you for your hard work. 
Yuta waved his hand dismissively and walked away after a few polite words. These execution missions are time-sensitive. After clashing with the one-eyed masked man, Yuto quickly found Goro Uchida, killed him, and immediately returned to Konoha. The boy originally planned to rest in the Senja clan territory, but as soon as he stepped through the gate, the Umbu summoned him to the Hokage's office. In the office, Hiruzen smiled at him, Yuto kun just returned? Yes, Hokage-sama, Yuto replied respectfully, though inwardly he was sarcastic. You had people waiting for me at the Senja clan gate. Don't you know if I just returned? I have a special mission for you, Yudo Kuen, the Hokage said with a chuckle, patting him on the shoulder. Do you remember the high-level meeting after the new year discussing the truce with Sunagakir? There's been progress on that. Sunagakir submitted a truce request, and we in Kanoha have agreed. As usual, we'll send someone with the initial draft of the peace treaty to negotiate with Sunagakir. Normally, Danzo would handle the negotiations, but this time, You'll be in charge, Yudo Kuen. Yudo nodded. He knew this was the third Hokage delegating power to Minato and trusting some core affairs to the new generation of leaders. Understood, Hokage-sama. When do I leave? No rush. This is not just a negotiation between Kanoha and Sunagakir, but also involves the interests of the Land of Fire and the Land of Wind. The daimyo of the Land of Fire will send a high-ranking official to accompany you. You have about a week to prepare and rest. The timing was perfect. Yudo thought to himself, I can get those two newly cultivated gods' masks ready. He then asked, Hokage-sama, do you have any specific instructions for the negotiation's outcome? Just don't push Sunagakir too hard. Do what you think is best. Yes, lying on a tatami mat, Yudo meticulously planned his next actions. Cultivate the new gods' masks. Represent Konoha in negotiations with Sunagakir, Intervene in the Battle of Canopy Bridge to obtain Madara's cells. The first two tasks were easy, but the last one was a risky venture. Even though Madara's body had deteriorated severely and he had given his Rinnegan to Nagato, Yudo didn't dare underestimate the man known as Madara Uchiha. Getting Madara's flesh and blood would undoubtedly require significant effort. Although Madara was very weak now, Yudo's instincts told him that the man must have hidden some trump cards and might reveal some powerful weapon in a crisis. But speaking of which, that one-eyed man's look really resembles a Beto, Yudo frowned, recalling the mysterious Sharingan that served as bait. Using the summoning technique, he arrived at Shikatsu Forest. Nowadays, this sage land had almost become a mobile secret base for Yudo. To facilitate easy access, Yudo had stored many of his illicit items here. On a clean stone platform lay the corpse of a young girl, her skin and bones broken, limbs twisted, blood drained, and clothes torn to shreds. Through the tattered clothing, a black rod was clearly visible. I must consider the possibility of the black rod's information being leaked. Both Madara and Nagato should be aware of this Inyang release product, Yudo muttered as he took out a small box covered with sealing techniques and carefully opened it, revealing a Sharingan inside. With a squelch, he removed her right eye and used medical ninjutsu to implant the Sharingan. If this Mangekyo Sharingan and the one used by the one-eyed masked man came from the same person, he would soon find out. Time flew by. After Yudo obtained the two newly cultivated god's masks and returned to Konoha, winter was drawing to a close. The snow melted, buds sprouted, and the land was full of life. Tsunade loosened her grip, letting the hair tie drop into her hand. She tied her golden hair into twin ponytails, gave a casual shake, and glanced at the boy next to her. This time, you're leading Kanoha. Don't go calling for sensei every time something happens. Understood. Yudo replied, stuffing the rice ball Shizen made into his mouth, then asked curiously, Sensei, why are you going this time? Ebizo and Chio are both cunning old foxes. Kanoha needs to send someone experienced too, the blonde woman laughed, rubbing her hands together. Besides, since returning from the Land of Rain, I haven't left the village for five months. I'm dying for some action. Even my dice are getting rusty. I'm going to gamble my heart out this time, he he he. Huh? Sonagakir is so poor they can barely afford ninja tools. Do they even have a casino? Kid, the poorer the place, the more casinos there are. I learned something new. The two chatted as they walked out of the Senju clan territory and headed to Kanoha's gate. A large convoy was waiting there. Unlike pure combat units, this convoy bore prominent banners. 
Besides the fully armed Kanoha Shinobi, there were also officials and attendants in traditional Fire Nation attire. A carriage stood at the convoy center, from which a man in his fifties poked his head out, Yudosama Tsunadeheim. He had a benevolent face and spoke politely, This journey to the land of wind will trouble you both. Araki Ruji, one of the daimyo's top ministers in the land of fire, was the nominal head of this delegation. Ruji-sama, Yudo stepped forward, you're too kind. Protecting high-ranking officials of the land of fire is one of our duties as Kanoha Shinobi. After some polite exchanges, they departed on time. In the one nation, one village system, the nation comes first, and the village second. The daimyo of the land of fire theoretically outranks the Hokage, can interfere in Kanoha's internal affairs, and oversees the nation's matters, acting as the autocrat of this land. Ruji, being one of the top three officials in the Fire Nation, would be on par with Hiruzen in Kanoha. Yet throughout the journey, Ruji gave no orders to Yudo and Tsunade, not even speaking in a commanding tone. He addressed them with utmost respect, as Sama and Haim, and if not for his senior age, he might have called them lords. This world ultimately belongs to Chakra. The system of national village alliances created by Hashirama Senju deviated from his original intentions from the start. No daimyo dares to order a kage, and no nation dares to dictate to a shinobi village. In the original story, after Payne's attack on Kanoha and Tsunade stepped down as Hokage, the daimyo of the Land of Fire came to appoint the next Hokage. However, he had no real authority and merely chose between Shikaku Nara's recommendation of Kakashi Hataki and Danzo Shimura's self-recommendation. He chose Danzo because of his stronger methods and tougher stance. In a way, nations are subservient to shinobi villages, providing them with population, a stable environment, vast strategic depth, and economic support. Power comes from strength, and shinobi, or chakra-wielding beings, are the ultimate representation of power in this world. The journey was peaceful, but because of the presence of ordinary people, Kanoha's delegation moved slowly. It took four days to reach the Fire Nation's border. The Fire Nation and the Land of Wind do not share a border. The Land of Rain and the Land of Valleys lie in between. With the intense fighting in the Land of Rain, to avoid complications, the delegation would pass through the Land of Valleys to reach Sunagakir's territory. Upon crossing the border into the Land of Valleys, they were greeted with horrific scenes. This small country had little self-defense capability. Although not a primary battlefield, occasional skirmishes between the fire and wind nations would decimate the fragile economy of the land of valleys. Kanoha's delegation could do nothing about this and had no grounds to intervene, so they silently sped up, focusing on their journey. In just half a day they were treading on yellow sand. It turns out that when a blade is held against your forehead, even the most stubborn person will lower their stance. At the border of the Land of Wind, in a desolate area piled with yellow sand, the key figures of Sunagakir were already waiting. Raza, with his short auburn hair, stood at the forefront of the group. Normally a stern and severe individual, he forced a smile under these circumstances. Yudo Hyuga, Tsunade Senju Araki Ruji. I've long heard of your great names, Lord Kazakage. Yudo greeted with a polite bow, displaying the refined elegance characteristic of the Hyuga clan. Tsunade gave Raza a slight nod, acknowledging him. Araki Ruji maintained his usual cheerful demeanor, dissolving any awkwardness with his words. Before long both sides were engaged in amicable conversation, creating an atmosphere as harmonious as an oasis in the desert. This seemed to start things off on the right foot, reassuring Raza that Kanahegakur wouldn't make things too difficult for them. What did you just say, Hyuga boy? Chiyo's voice almost shattered the roof, sharp and filled with incredulous anger. Send the fourth Kazakage's child to Kanoha as a hostage? Hostage? What hostage? Yudo blinked innocently. The desert is harsh and cold. As the Kazakage's child, they deserve a better life. Kanoha, with its abundant resources, is the best place for nurturing. No, absolutely not. Chiyo slammed her hand heavily on the table. Temari is a girl and she's only three years old. How can she go to Kanoha? I heard she's the Kazakage's eldest daughter. Doesn't she have a younger brother? Yudo asked. Kankuro is not even two years old. He can't leave his mother. Oh. Yudo nodded thoughtfully, then revealed his true intentions. 
I also heard on my way here that the Kazakage's wife is pregnant again. Seeing that Chio was about to speak, Yudo's tone suddenly turned stern and rigid. Refuse the first time, refuse the second time, and refuse the third time. Do you still want to negotiate? Offering the Kazakage's child is simply to show Sunagakir's sincerity. The child won't be harmed. Kanoha will raise them, teaching them shinobi arts. The war with you has cost the land of fire dearly. If there's no show of sincerity, how can we negotiate? Forcing an infant to leave their home and go to a foreign land seemed extremely cruel, a blatant display of dominance by a superior nation over a defeated one. However, when it came to Gara, Yudo felt no moral dilemma. To be fair, the hardships Gara endured as a child were far worse than those of Naruto Uzumaki. Growing up in Konoha as a hostage might actually be better, at least allowing him to sleep peacefully. You, Chio gritted her teeth, struggling to find a good argument. Honestly, she didn't particularly care where Raza's children grew up. But if Raza, as the Kazakage, suffered such a significant loss at the start, it would be detrimental to future negotiations. Negotiation is about power and momentum. Lose once, and you lose every step. Unfortunately, understanding this doesn't help. The situation is stronger than people. Chio sighed and subconsciously glanced at the blonde woman. She had long admired Tsunade. During the Second Shinobi World War, Chio would poison, and Tsunade would detoxify. Both were top medical experts of their time, sharing a mutual respect. The blonde woman, feeling her gaze, smiled at Chio and then continued to meticulously paint her nails. Beside her, Araki Ruji displayed a similar disinterest, grinning like a mascot. It was clear they had left everything to Yudo. Chio's breath caught, but before she could speak, Raza suddenly said calmly, I thought you wanted something significant. If it's children, I can give you all three. That's unnecessary. Yudo smiled. As a gesture of Sunagakir's sincere desire to restore friendly relations with Kanoha, one child is enough. Alright. After the child is born, they will be sent to Kanoha, as expected of the Kazakage. Now, let's begin the formal negotiations. Yudo took out a sealed scroll and unfurled a thick stack of documents, looking like a dictionary. Ignoring the Sunagakir member's twitching brows, he spoke softly, first, regarding the delineation of borders, to ensure the unbreakable friendship between the land of fire and the land of wind, Kanoha wishes to obtain control of the Valley of the Dead Fortress on the border of the land of wind. Ha ha ha. The blonde woman leaned on Yudo's shoulder, laughing uproariously. You should have seen Raza's face when you got to the 34th point. He looked like Gamma Bunta, the toad. Too bad most of your conditions weren't accepted by Sunagakir today. That's how negotiations go, haggling back and forth. Today was about testing the limit. The remaining days will be a battle of wills. Yudo patted his sensei's hand. We have plenty of time here. We can take it slow. Sunagakir won't hold out for long. They'll eventually compromise. You're really something. The blonde woman tapped her student's chest, not in a teasing manner. The crystal pendant passed down from Hashirama Senju hung there, symbolizing the will of fire that Yudo had inherited, marking him as a shinobi capable of standing on his own. By the way, Sunagakir does resemble this desert in some ways, Yudo mused. In his previous life, reading the manga, he had found many characters from this shinobi village in the desert to be memorable. They appeared cold and unfeeling on the surface but were deeply emotional inside. Even Sasori, who defected after killing the third Kazakage, chose to die in the embrace of his father and mother puppets, revealing some secrets about the Akatsuki organization to Chio before his death. A rough, hardened exterior, yet a delicate, sensitive heart. Like the desert? The blonde woman tilted her head, not understanding her student's analogy. Yudo chuckled. Because it's the color of gold, sensei. Now that we've finished our business for today, shouldn't you... You know me so well. Tsunade beamed and pulled out three dice. These have brought me luck through many battles. The days in Sunagakir were quite pleasant overall. After all, Kanoha was the victor, holding the upper hand with their strong position. Yudo could make demands freely, with Sunagakir having no choice but to negotiate. This was not a negotiation but a robbery under the guise of peace. Yet, even though they were suffering, the Land of Wind had to accept the situation. As Kazakage, Raza couldn't disregard the lives of his shinobi and continue the war. 
Yudo and his group were treated well, staying as unwelcome guests in Sunagakir for over half a month. The mood among the Kanoha group was generally good, except for Tsunade. Every evening, the blonde woman would head to the casino with her beloved dice, only to lose all her money and even end up pawning her dice. In the final days of the negotiations with the Land of Wind, Tsunade was quite disheartened. All right, Yudo stepped back a couple of steps, admiring the red ribbon tied in Tsunade's hair, and said with satisfaction, it's beautiful. Looks like my talent for tying hair knots is on par with my kenjutsu. Tsunade puffed her cheeks lightly. Humph, that's because I'm good looking. Yudo reached out and tucked a stray lock of golden hair behind her ear. You're right, sensei. There's no woman in the shinobi world more beautiful than you. Today, Tsunade wasn't wearing her usual green kanoha vest. Instead, she was dressed in a traditional outfit. She wore a crimson hakama on the lower half, a small-sleeved kimono on the upper half, with layers underneath, and an oversized chihaya cloak on top. This ensemble of white robes and red skirts, adorned with pine and crane patterns, was extremely ancient. Before chakra existed in this world, shrine maidens often dressed this way. A thousand years ago, when the god tree descended and people gained supernatural powers, the profession of shrine maidens almost disappeared, and such attire was only seen at weddings or funerals. However, traditional clothing was passed down, and people would wear it during festivals or significant life event. Today was the last day for the Kanoha group in Sunagakir. Coincidentally, it was also a traditional festival in the Land of Wind, the Flowing Fire Festival. Bonfires, carnivals, and market dances filled the night. Before this, Yudo had no idea that Sunagakir, with its endless sand, had such a festival. You're really lucky, Tsunade said with a bright smile, lifting the curtain at the door. It's getting very late, let's go out. Outside, the starry sky was brilliant, and the yellow sand resembled a sea. Surrounding Sunagakir, countless low huts and wooden stands had appeared, filled with vendors and crowds from all over the land of wind. They lit bonfires, laughing and lying on the yellow sand, throwing burning wooden sticks into the sky as if trying to poke holes in the night. Kanoha's biggest festival is Grand Sports Festival, but in the Land of Wind, the most lively is tonight's Flowing Fire Festival. The desert is harsh, so the people living on this land dress up and celebrate today, laughing and throwing torches into the sky, telling the heavens, the unlucky folks in the Land of Wind are still alive. Mere dust and sand can't take our lives. Yudo didn't understand these stories. He just felt that tonight was very lively, like the New Year's Eve countdown in a big city from his previous life. Tsunade pulled his hand and ran out of Sunagakir to the market outside. The golden-haired woman first bought two masks for herself and Yudo, then shouted in his ear, Pay up? The young branch family member hesitated, remembering that his sensei had lost all her money in the casino. He laughed, handed money to the vendor, and then gave his entire purse to Tsunade. Don't spend it all, sensei. I've used up all my savings buying explosive tags. Don't worry. Tsunade patted her chest, indicating she was reliable. Through the mask, her eyes sparkled as she grabbed her student's hand and started wandering. Initially, they weren't wandering aimlessly. Being shinobis, Tsunade and Yudo had a strong sense of direction and wouldn't get lost easily. However, the flowing fire festival's market was vast and chaotic, with sand underfoot, bonfires, and people in costumes all around, and the noisy calls of vendors in their ears. Without road signs, it was hard to remember their route. So, they let themselves go, eating, drinking, playing, and buying as they went, until their money was almost gone. Finally, the teacher and student walked to the edge of the wide market. Here, there weren't many people, just hundreds of thick wooden stakes driven into the yellow sand, whose purpose was unknown but probably related to the festival's traditions. Phew! Tsunade exhaled lightly, leaning against a wooden stake and rubbing her shoulders, Yudo, how long have we been walking? Three hours. So tired. Hey Yudo, do you remember that pig-shaped candy? I remember, we bought it. It was so good, do you have any left? Here. Yudo opened his palm, revealing the small pig-shaped candy. Tsunade reached to take it, but the young man suddenly grabbed her wrist, lifted her hand above her head, and pressed it against the wooden stake. Sensei, you seem tired. I'll feed you instead. Yudo lightly lifted Tsunade's mask to just below her nose, revealing her fair, smooth chin and rosy lips. Blinded by the mask, 
Tsunade trembled but didn't resist, leaning softly into Yudo's arms, waiting to be fed. Both knew that the lips about to be touched couldn't possibly be just for the candy. Jingle jingle. However, at that moment, a bell rang. Candy for sale. Handmade candy. Tsunade snapped out of it, pushing Yudo away and hurriedly putting her mask back on. The candy is so good, I'll buy more. Then, she ran off in a flash. Just three centimeters. Yudo regretted, slapping his thigh and looking at the disappearing blonde. He knew his sensei would avoid him for the next few days. Annoyed, he looked up at the candy vendor. No wonder he has so much candy left. An itinerant vendor with such low emotional intelligence, really? Yudo approached the candy vendor, annoyed. Boss, give me two pieces to try. Sure. The vendor's voice was extremely hoarse. His exposed skin looked like withered tree bark, dry and loose. Yudo hesitated, softening his tone. How old are you? Very old, young man. What shape candy do you want? The old man, hunched over, his hands steady, quickly rummaged through his bag. A bird shape. Elder, how old is very old? Older than anyone you've ever met. The old man smiled, handing him a bird-shaped candy. Young man, was that your girlfriend just now? Uh. Seems she's someone you care about. The old man felt a bit guilty. Sorry, old eyes are dim, I disturbed you. No problem, Yudo waved generously. Being young is great, the old man sighed, you can make up for mistakes right away, there's plenty of time, unlike us old folks, who have to roam the streets buying candy to fix things for our grandchildren. As he spoke, he raised his hand, young man, do you recognize this? The old man's skeletal fist was clenched, with his thumb pressed on the second joint of his index finger, leaving a gap in his palm. In an instant, the world went silent. Yudo felt as if he had fallen into an icy abyss, with long buried memories roaring violently. Three years ago, Shinosuke Hyuga made this gesture too. Finally found you, little bird pecking at the cage. The old man's hoarse voice reached Yudo's ears. At the same time, excruciating pain erupted in his brain and eyes. The world spun, darkening in the overwhelming agony. Caged bird activated. The cursed seal remained the same, but the caged bird was no longer the caged bird of the past. In the moment of extreme pain, Yudo's wrist shook as he took out a forehead protector from his ninja pouch and slapped it onto his forehead. With a crack, the upper part of the mask shattered, and the god's mask placed inside the forehead protector adhered to his skin. The blood of the Atsutsuki clan flowed within him, and the ocular power and chakra of the sage's lineage roared within him. The cursed seal was forcefully suppressed, and the caged bird symbol on Yudo's forehead vanished leaving only a rhombus-shaped strength of the hundred seal. Huff, huff, Yudo panted heavily, the remnants of the pain still tearing at his nerves. An old, withered man popped a candy into his mouth and chuckled. It seems I guessed right. You're not going to take off your mask? Is your face really that ugly? Yudo coldly stared at the old man, the pain gradually subsiding. A golden long sword appeared in his hand, surrounded by repulsive and attractive forces like invisible giant pythons. Young man, you're really impatient. The old man shook his head. You're planning on fighting me so close to Sunagakir? You want everyone to know your identity? And for me, being seen by the Senja girl will be quite troublesome. Yudo frowned, we change places? Fine. Yudo picked up the mask fragments on the ground, leaped into the air, and flew swiftly into the desert, with the old man yawning and shakily standing up to follow. In Yudo's Byakugan vision, he could clearly see all of the old man's movements. He wasn't flying like Yudo, nor running, but sliding at high speed on an invisible air path, as if sitting on a slide, a movement method I've never seen before. Yudo frowned and accelerated again. After half a minute, the two stopped in the deserted depths of the desert. Yudo's hand flashed with golden light as the Kumanaba reappeared. In mask mode, he had 2 minutes and 12 seconds left. He had to kill this man. He gazed at the old man's pure white eyes, slowly removed his mask, and revealed a youthful and handsome face. His forehead was smooth with a purple strength of the hundred seal adding a touch of mystery. You've taken off your mask, it seems I'm destined to die here today? The old man paused thoughtfully and said, judging by your face, you're not the impatient type. Mm. You want to fight so much? Then, the method to remove the caged bird seal and this powerful chakra mode must have time limits, right? You're talking way too much. 
Yudo huffed coldly, stomping the ground. A huge sand mountain was crushed under his feet, and with the extreme reaction force, he charged at the old man. The golden light flashed as the Kumanaba slashed down fiercely. The old man had little reaction, merely extending a finger and precisely touching the tip of the Kumanaba blade. Revolving Heaven, King's Spear, a rapidly rotating chakra defense shield appeared, but unlike the regular version, the old man's revolving heaven was in a bullet shape, an offensive form. The roaring chakra collided with the Kumanaba, causing the air to tremble. The two were in a stalemate. Yudo gritted his teeth, unlocking the Ean seal. The immense power surged forth, the repulsive force splitting the sand below as if a sudden chasm appeared, and they both fell. However, Yudo could fly. In an instant, he pulled up, gaining a positional advantage. The golden long sword vanished, and all chakra poured into his eyes. Murakumo. Slash. An incredibly sharp light appeared beneath the sand, a dojitsu rooted in the concept of cutting through everything, striking the old man's revolving heaven. With a crack, the chakra defense shield shattered. Impressive. The old man muttered, clasping his hands together. Buzz, from the high sky, an invisible air current suddenly shot down, immense in power and eerily fast. Taking advantage of the momentary lag as the revolving heaven shattered, the air current bypassed them and intercepted the associated technique of the half-awakened Tensegan. Boom. The endless sands churned, forming dozens of giant sand mountains over a hundred meters high, only to be flattened and exploded by a greater force. The sand was thrown into the air like an inverted rain. Soon after, Yudo climbed out, the pale blue of his half-awakened Tensegan dim and withered, clearly overexhausted in chakra. Despite the intense consumption, there were no tangible results from the battle. The old man suddenly appeared on the sand a hundred meters away, his clothes tattered, but his Byakugan shone brilliantly, like the gaze of a deity. Who are you? Yudo exhaled lightly. Ryasuki Hyuga, the old man said softly, in the shinobi world, everyone calls me Heavenly Shinobi or Creator of Revolving Heaven. Ah, a legendary figure. Not as famous as you now, Moon God. One more question, answer it if you want. How did you find me? I knew someone needed 30 Hyuga corpses. My eyes can see some peculiar things. The heavenly shinobi flipped his eyelids, showing Yudo the blood vessels within, and continued. I saw those corpses wrapped in the smell of Shikatsu forest, and everyone knows there's only one Hyuga who can summon slugs. Man proposes and God disposes. Yudo remembered a quote said by a character he admired from his past life and smiled bitterly, taking a deep breath, ready to fight again. But unexpectedly, the heavenly shinobi suddenly asked, Is your name, Yudo Hyuga? Yes. Who are your parents? Yudo frowned but answered, Sogo Hyuga, Yuki Hyuga. Sigh, don't know them. Your grandparents? Yuichi Hyuga, Noko Hyuga. The old man slapped his thigh abruptly, Ah. Yuichi is the youngest son of the ninth branch. He seemed pleased, carefully scrutinizing Yudo, comparing with the face in his memory. No kidding, the nose does resemble. Yuichi was an honest guy, and his descendant turned out to be someone like you, ha ha. The old man laughed heartily, then stopped and continued, You're from the branch family, but still a Hyuga. Yuichi and I were close. If I bully his descendant like this, I wouldn't face him in the afterlife. Honest people are scary when angry. So, I'll be straightforward. I must kill you. No room for negotiation. But I'm an old man who's lived too long. Fighting you to this point is a blessing from the sage. My remaining chakra and energy can only support one set of gentle fists. After using it, I'll probably die of exhaustion. Of course, this set of gentle fists is a lost technique. Only I know it. Its name is Extreme Heaven. Heavenly Shinobi's Gentle Fist, Unlearnable Gentle Fist, Lost Byakugan Technique, Skill That Amazes Even Sages. Everyone calls it Extreme Heaven. You've witnessed its power firsthand. So, the old man extended his hand in the standard Hyuga starting stance. So, descendant of Yuichi, want to try again? Yudo gazed at the old man's hands and raised his golden long sword. He too had reasons for fighting to the death, leaving no room for retreat. The old man clasped his hands together once more. Yudo's eyebrow twitched, a feeling of helplessness rising within him. Why does he remind me of Hashirama Senju? Clapping his hands and call forth anything he desires. 
Once again, an invisible force surged from the sky, powerful and astonishingly fast. However, Yudo's half-awakened Tensegan could still see it. He turned the blade to block, sending himself flying several hundred meters away. Kill him! Yudo commanded softly. The sword handle transformed into a golden giant, rushing madly toward the old man, while the blade turned into armor, firmly protecting Yudo's body. Another force struck down fiercely. Protected by the golden armor, Yudo extended a hand and used the Fuenjutsu absorption seal. Boom. His body was pushed back, his arm trembling slightly, with blood trickling through the armor's gaps. But he wasn't blown away. 55% chakra, 15% compressed air, 30% high-speed liquid molecules, spiraling, advancing in sequence. Yudo analyzed through the pain, his eyes widening as he reached a conclusion, this ratio and method of attack, it's so familiar. Have you figured it out? Descendant of Yuichi, the old man laughed heartily. Extreme heaven 64 palms. 64 forces suddenly emerged from all directions. Unable to dodge, Yudo could only use his repulsive barrier to take the hit, breaking through the yellow sand beneath him to escape underground. He understood what extreme heaven was now. It was essentially 8 trigrams 64 palms. Extreme heaven was just a variant of gentle fist. Gentle fist's principle of attack is to inject chakra into the enemy's body, causing internal damage. Most gentle fist techniques require close combat to inject chakra at the moment of contact. But extreme heaven is different. It injects chakra into the enemy's body, which is conceived as the world, by imagining the world as a person, with the actual enemy as mere acupuncture points within, the attack speed and trajectory become unique. The technique considers the human as a small acupuncture point within the world, allowing chakra to reach them instantly. This is why no one in the Huga clan has mastered it for years. The method of channeling chakra in this technique is insane and sinister, instilling fear even if one knows the technique. Chakra, being a fusion of physical and spiritual energy, is influenced by one's willpower. Yudo's eyes sparkled as he burst out of the sand. Is there more to this technique? There is. The old man knocked away the sword handle giant, brimming with spirit. All gentle fist techniques can be used for long-range attacks. Incredible. Yudo sincerely admired. With this technique, can you defeat the first Hokage Hashirama? The old man's smile froze. Ah, so you can't beat him. What about Madara Uchiha? The old man didn't reply, his face growing a bit sour. In my prime, I was among the top three in the world. Yet, you compare me to those two in human powerhouses? If I could beat them, I'd be on the Hokage Rock, wouldn't I? Kid, stop talking nonsense in the middle of a fight. The extreme heaven technique struck again, with forces converging from all directions towards Yudo. But this time, the young branch member didn't dodge. He charged straight at the old man. I've won. He murmured, blood dripping from his chest. Meanwhile, in the old man's Byakugan vision, a girl's figure appeared. It was Miko, dead for days, her body embedded with black receivers and her right eye a freshly implanted Sharingan. In the brief time underground, Yudo not only impaled his chest with the black receiver but also summoned Miko's body from the Shikatsu forest. Pop! The mysterious Sharingan transformed, its three tomo merging into a flower-shaped Mangekyo. Miko's corpse fixed its gaze on Yudo. In the next moment, the Mangekyo's power erupted. Yudo's body crackled, almost ignoring spatial barriers, dodging countless forces and reaching the old man's side. Let's end your life with gentle fists. Yudo whispered, striking the old man's chest. Fifty years ago, the old man had a thousand ways to dodge or counterattack. How strong is the Mangekyo Sharingan? Could it surpass Madara and Izuna? But he was old now. Blood splattered as the old man was blown away. His decaying body crumbled under the intense battle and injuries, unable to sustain his life any longer. As his strength rapidly faded, the old man's faintly Byakugan still captured everything around him. The endless yellow sand, the starry sky, the puppetized girl on the ground, and the young branch member standing tall. This boy, on a blood-red night, would destroy the entire Hyuga clan. He had many powerful techniques, including the extreme heaven. Today's fierce battle had only armed the enemy. Yet, the old man felt strangely at peace. At death's door, 
rising from the grave to attack the restless caged bird, even in failure, he could proudly say he had no regrets. If he could kill, then the boy deserved to die. If not, then so be it. As for revealing to the world that Yudo Hugo was the moon god, the old man never considered it. He was the old clan head of the main family, but also the grave keeper of the Hyuga. Boom, boom. The sound of Yudo and the old man hitting the ground echoed almost simultaneously. The mask mode ended. Yudo quickly got up, rubbing his eyes strained from overusing his vision, and pulled out another god's mask from his ninja tools, clutching it tightly. This was his last mask. Using it would mean he couldn't participate in the Battle of Canopy Bridge. But even so, Yudo resolved that if the old man made any move, he would immediately enter mask mode. However, after waiting for a while, the old man made no move. He just lay there, his chest rising and falling unsteadily, silent and unmoving. After a long hesitation, Yudo walked over, holding an explosive tag in his hand. Cough, cough. The old man suddenly spat out blood and sat up. Yuichi's child, you hid hard. When I go to Pure Land, I must tell Yuichi all about it. He glanced at Yudo, who was undecided and smiled. I'm dying. To die from exhaustion in battle sounds better than dying of old age for a shinobi. Yuichi's child, Yudo Hyuga. Moon god, lone lion, rebellious caged bird, ha. Huh? I've want to ask you one question. Aren't you curious why I'm here? I walked here myself. Before Yudo could speak, the old man began talking to himself. I was born forty years before the founding of Kanoha, about ten years older than Hashirama and Madara. If you calculate it, I am already ninety years old. Chakra can give shinobi strength, but it cannot make us live longer. Even the legendary sage of six paths couldn't escape death. I am a remnant of the warring states period. I started killing at the age of five, biting on a kanai. From then until Kanoha was founded fifty years ago, I spent every day in slaughter. Ryasuki Hyuga lifted his shirt, revealing his withered, scarred skin. Every bone, every piece of skin, every muscle has been tormented by enemies. Under normal circumstances, years of battle and near a hundred years of age should have left me bedridden, even if I were barely alive. However, I walked out of that grave, traveled long distances, and fought with you, boy. This is not something someone my age can do. Even Hashirama and Madara would be bedridden in their old age. Moreover, I don't know any secret techniques to delay aging. I have aged naturally in pain and years, and I am infinitely close to death. Last month, my cells couldn't produce a single drop of chakra. However, the old man sighed, speaking slowly and deliberately. At the moment I thought of killing that rebellious branch family, my eye power and chakra returned to my body. Yudo stood in place, perhaps because of the yellow sand. He felt his legs go weak. He somewhat understood what the old man meant. Judging by your expression, it seems you know what I want to say. You are a smart child, a descendant of Yuichi, the old man said, patting the ground beside him. Sit down. I can hold on for a few more minutes. Yudo silently sat down next to the old man. Beneath him was rolling sand, above was a brilliant starry sky. The starlight shone on him, yet Yudo felt cold all over. It seems you really understand what I meant. The old man's expression was complex as he continued. Yes, the moment I decided to become your enemy, the world stood by my side. Stones, plants, wind and snow, mountains, animals, humans. Everything you see, hear and touch has chakra, the difference is only in quantity and usability. Chakra, chakra. Because I have lived long, I know many strange truths, such as the tailed beasts, aggregates of huge chakra, which also have emotions. Some humans, extremely powerful, can even have their chakra reincarnated over hundreds of generations. I have always thought, the ninja world is filled with chakra, which is no different from saying chakra possesses the ninja world. Chakra can reincarnate, feel anger and joy, so it's clear that the laws of all things are closely related to chakra. Absolutely, absolutely not entirely objective. The end of the world might have been set the moment chakra appeared. People are pleased with the strong nations and shinobi villages they have built, thinking they have created destiny, but in reality, that is only an inevitable result under the king's will. And the king of this world is named Chakra. Being a renegade from family and village is nothing new, I have seen many, but living outside the king's script, 
Do you know what you are facing, descendant of Yuichi? Yudo stared blankly at the starry sky. The night sky of the ninja world was filled with stars, like diamonds and jade embedded in a vast black curtain. However, at this moment, he only felt that those starlights were full of malice. Yudo knew very well that the old man was completely right. As a transmigrator, he had read the original work and knew the final outcome of the ninja world was Naruto and Sasuke fighting Kagaya Atsutsuki. Or to put it another way, it was the chakra of Indra and Azure reincarnating and sealing Kagaya's chakra. The final fate of the ninja world was essentially a battle of chakra. But in this predetermined script, suddenly a caged bird appeared. The caged bird seal is the most stubborn curse in the ninja world, entangling its bearer for life, even surviving world reincarnation. To eradicate it entirely, one must possess the power of the sage, whether sage eyes or sage body can resolve the caged bird. But the chakra of the ninja world has a fixed quantity. In a thousand years there might have been many who achieved sage status, but it was all just the reincarnated chakra of Azura and Indra, just the same thing in a different form. Including Hamura and Hagoromo, it's just the Atsutsuki family. A caged bird seeking to become a sage, to gain freedom, would inevitably change the world's final fate. This is absolutely not allowed. Even though the king of the world, Chakra, does not have a true personality, it would instinctively prevent such rebellion. Ryusuke Hyuga's body coming back to life is the world's counterattack. Descendant of Yuichi, what are you going to do to make the world so angry? The old man sighed. No matter what your thoughts are, stop now. Shinobi are weapons, possessing power beyond ordinary people, but ultimately, our opponents have always been humans. To go against the world, can you still be called a shinobi? Bowing your head is not shameful. I think, even the Sage of Six Paths was in some sense a slave to Chakra. Yudo grabbed a handful of sand, letting it slip through his fingers. The yellow sand falls, trees wither, birds rot in the soil. The predetermined trajectory of this world is the chakra battle of Azura, Indra, and Kagaya. It seems lively, but it is actually like stagnant water. A thousand years ago, the divine tree descended, chakra spread throughout the world, wars became more frequent, and the death toll far exceeded that before chakra appeared. For such a long time, a full ten centuries, not a single smart person thought chakra is a precious energy source, it should be used to improve productivity and benefit the world. Is this human nature's flaw, or the result of Chakra's hidden guidance? All life lives and dies on a predetermined path. The so-called ninja world is a huge cage. Thank you. Yudo spoke, saying his first words. Those words just now were very helpful to me. Maybe in the future, more and more people will stand against me, but no matter what appears ahead, nothing can stop my steps. The night wind blew through his hair. The young man suddenly laughed, his eyes clear, like a refreshing spring. I am no one's slave. A raging inferno lit up the night sky, thick smoke curling like dragons as the ornate buildings went up in flames. Severed limbs, blood, agonized screams, and angry shouts. It was a night painted crimson. Ryasuki, get inside. A one-armed man clad in armor pushed a boy into a hidden room. Don't come out until reinforcements arrive. Father, the boy shouted desperately, let me fight with you, I'm not afraid to die. Don't be foolish, my son. The one-armed man turned back, his left eye bleeding profusely, the Byakugan gouged out by the enemy. Despite his gruesome appearance, the long-lost leader of the Hyuga clan smiled at his child. It is a father's shame to let his son die alongside him. With a thud, the hidden room's door closed tightly. Ryasuki pounded the walls madly. His fists bled, bones fractured, but the boy's resolve was as unyielding as iron, unaffected by the pain. It was unclear how much time had passed before the hidden room's door suddenly opened. Reinforcements had still not arrived. The clan's main forces had been lured away. The once lavish Hyuga estate had become a ruin, with only scattered enemies collecting their spoils. Lying in the distance was his father, long dead, his eyes gouged out. Ah! Ryasuki bit down on a kanai, like a wild beast that had lost its mind. No one noticed the faint glint in the boy's eyes. Fifteen years later, Ryasuki sama a humble branch family man said respectfully, We're almost at the battlefield. Mm. Ryasuki Hyuga chewed on a new blade of grass, savoring its sweetness. Hey Yuichi, don't be so formal. We grew up together. 
All this sama nonsense is too distant. Ryasuki sama Roku bent down meticulously. The main and branch families are different. Damn you. Ryasuki started to curse but stopped halfway. Forget it. No point bullying an honest man. Yuichi is too rigid. It's just us here. Why be so formal? Ah, uh, he is getting married soon. I hope his kids aren't as stiff as him. While Ryasuki was lost in thought, the dense forest below suddenly erupted in a cacophony of battle cries. They're here. Ryasuki's veins bulged, his chakra surging. Those two kids, they're the monsters the clan spoke of? Yes, Ryasuki-sama. Yuichi nodded. One is a Senju, the other an Uchiha. Both ten years old. Ryasuki's eyes flashed with killing intent. They are indeed powerful. For the Hyuga's sake, I may need to. Ryasuki-sama. Those two are the eldest sons of their respective clan leaders. Killing them will provoke the Senju and Uchiha's wrath. Besides, the day after tomorrow is when you become clan leader. Please reconsider, humph. Ryasuki suppressed his urge to act. Didn't expect you to have such foresight. You flatter me, Ryasuki-sama. Yuichi remained humble. These foresight were taught by my uncle, the one you just cursed. Ha ha, Yuichi. I knew you had a devious side, ha ha. Thirty-one years later, year one of Konoha, so? This is our village. A man wearing ceremonial robes laughed heartily, his long hair flowing down to his waist, eyes shining with a light that outshone the sun. The leaders of the major clans stood behind him. Even the most battle-hardened warriors couldn't help but feel a softening in their hearts. This is Konoha, a place where their descendants can grow up in peace. Ryasuki stared blankly at the Hokage building. Years of slaughter had left his body on the brink of collapse, often racked with pain at night. But now, none of that mattered. Since the night his father died, a desire for peace had taken root deep within his heart, and it was finally realized. Ryasuki? A voice called from behind him. Without turning, he knew who it was. Madara, what is it? Come spar with me tonight. If it's you, you might entertain me for a while. Oh, I thought only Hashirama mattered to you. He's being too busy being the Hokage now, and you're half as good as him. Ha ha ha. By the way, what happened to that branch family guard of yours? His revolving heaven was decent. He's dead. Ryasuki instinctively clenched his fists, muttering damn you, but refraining from an outright confrontation. Yuichi had died three years ago, killed by the Sharingan. Sixty-one years later, year thirty of Konoha. Hide, the coffin wrapped in green vines disappeared into the rain. Ryasuki lowered his eyes, letting the raindrops slide down his face. Madara had left the village and was killed at the Valley of the End. Hashirama's health had declined rapidly upon his return and he passed away last night, given a grand funeral as the Hokage. In the end, you two young guys went before me, Ryasuki thought, turning to meet the eyes of his clansmen. In those white eyes, ambition and fervor burned. The god of Shinobi was dead, and the man with the fearsome eyes was buried at the Valley of the End. No shinobi stronger than Ryasuki existed anymore. The title of second Hokage, apart from Ryasuki, who else would have the guts to claim the position? Rumor had it the first favored Tobarama Senju. Ha what a joke. Being a shinobi is about who's stronger, isn't it? The future of wielding power loomed in the minds of the Hyuga clan. But no one expected that this legendary shinobi would leave the village the night Hashirama was buried. Before departing, he left only one sentence for his clan. For an old relic of the warring states like myself, the only suitable place is the grave. 89 years and 11 months later, year 58 of Konoha, the now decrepit Ryasuki stared at the misty sphere before him, his eyes glimmering gold. Faintly, he smelled the scent of the Shikatsu forest. Strange, is this related to the slugs? He moved his fingers, feeling the sudden surge of chakra and ocular power. Even stranger. HM, a little action before I die. Let's see that restless caged bird. Ninety years later, present, I am no one's slave. The clear voice of the branch family boy reached his ears, and Ryasuki lay frozen. The ninety-year-old man sensed that the caged bird before him was a shinobi like no other, those pure white eyes destined to turn the color of a sage's one day, spreading fire across the world. Damn you, Yuichi, you devious man! Ryasuki thought as his body began to disintegrate. From skin, to blood vessels, to bones, to every cell. Chakra was not omnipotent. 
Death was consuming Ryosuke's body. The old man endured the pain, looking at the branch family boy, a faint smile on his lips. According to the rules of the warring states, you have the right to dispose of my body. This old man's body will completely disintegrate, but these eyes still hold some sage essence. Do with them as you will. Understood. Ryosuke seemed to sigh. I promise, these eyes will see the Hyuga clan's final conclusion. All right, let me die knowing. The old man hesitated, his body disintegrating faster, before finally speaking. Cough, cough, that girl from the Senju clan earlier, she's Hashirama's granddaughter, right? What's your relationship with her? Sensei and student. Nonsense. You know what I mean. Have you too, made a lifelong commitment? Not yet. Not yet, huh? You don't seem like the type to speak carelessly. Does that mean it's a sure thing? Well done. The old man patted his thigh in excitement, his muscles and skin tearing open, but he seemed unaware, laughing loudly. Hashirama must be over the moon. Would release, huh? So what? His precious granddaughter is still taken by a Hyuga boy. When I get to the Pure Land, I'll have a drink with him, ha ha. The old man's vision blurred, darkness rapidly engulfing everything. In the final moments before his consciousness faded, images flashed in his mind. His father's bloodied back, Yuichi's honest face, Hashirama's hearty laugh, Madara's proud Sharingan and finally, the bright, pure eyes of the branch family boy. Ninety years of trials, ninety years of tribulations, starting his shinobi career with vengeance, leaving the world in triumphant laughter. What a remarkable life. Sure enough, she's still avoiding me. Yudo turned his head, glancing at Tsunade, who was leisurely lagging at the back of the group, and chuckled inwardly. That night, Yudo had almost managed to make a move, but was interrupted by Ryosuke Hyuga, leaving his attempt unsuccessful. The blonde woman had adopted an ostrich-like behavior, hiding her head whenever her apprentice approached, fearing he might try to feed her sweets again. This was the second day since the Kanoha group had left Sunagakir. Just an hour ago, they had crossed the border of the Land of Valleys and returned to the Land of Fire, with the journey being smooth and uneventful. In Yudo's ceiling scroll lay thick documents detailing the peace treaty between the Land of Fire and the Land of Wind, four copies in total, one for each shinobi village and one for each daimyo. Once Hiruzen and Raza formally signed the alliance, the war between the two nations would come to an end. After that, with this achievement, Yudo would become the top candidate for diplomatic affairs, having the authority to engage in trade negotiations and military discussions with other countries. With Hiruzen growing older and expressing his desire to retire in multiple public appearances, it was clear that Kanoha would soon welcome its fourth Hokage. Rumors from the Hokage building suggested that once Minato Namikaze took office, Koharu Yudatain, Hamura Mitokado, and Danzo Shimura would temporarily retain their positions. Hiruzen Saratobi, Tsunade Haim, and Yudo would be given advisory roles, with Hiruzen coordinating the transition of power. Once the elderly quartet officially retired, a new generation would step in. This plan seemed reliable, ensuring a smooth transfer of power among the old, middle-aged, and young generations, maintaining Kanoha's strength for another 20 years. Provided Minato didn't die too early. Of course, Yudo wasn't concerned with next year's Nine Tails incident at the moment. His mind was focused on the imminent Battle of Canopy Bridge. Although he had heeded the warnings from the old man, he didn't plan to proceed cautiously. Perhaps there is indeed a will in the world that will try to stop me, Yudo thought. But that won't change my resolve. At most, it means planning more carefully and preparing several backup plans. His main goal was simple. Eliminate anyone who stood in his way. The security within the Land of Fire was decent, and no foolish bandits dared to rob a team guarded by Lone Lion and Tsunade Haim. Another day passed, and Ruji Araki bid farewell to the Kanoha Shinobi, returning to the capital of the Land of Fire. With the departure of the ordinary people in the group, their pace quickened tenfold. Naturally, Tsunade could no longer use rear guard as an excuse to stay at the back. Sensei, Yudo approached her, looking serious. Why do you always stay at the back? Are you feeling unwell? The blonde woman shot him a glance and continued walking in silence. Looks like you haven't rested well. Here, sensei, replenish your energy. I'll give you a candy. You. Watch the occasion. There are so many people ahead. Hmm. In the sunlight, 
The handsome young man held out a pig-shaped candy in his palm. That night, you said you liked this candy. So the next day, I found the vendor in the desert and bought them all. Well, at least you know how to respect your teacher. Tsunade huffed, taking the candy and putting it in her mouth. As she gently bit down, the sweet flavor exploded on her tongue. It warmed her heart. Shursway looked up, raindrops falling on his brow. At the same time, a white-haired girl leaped down from a tree. With top-tier Shunshin and Sharingan abilities, Shursway instinctively dodged. But he chose not to, colliding with the girl. They rolled together, tumbling far. You pig! Ruri jumped up. Why didn't you dodge? Then you would have fallen to the ground. It's raining today, and the forest is muddy. Your clothes would get dirty? Shursway stood up, rubbing his shoulder nonchalantly. Besides, didn't you protect us with your Shikatsumiyaku? The white bones that had formed a ball around them retracted into Ruri's body. She spat lightly. Because I knew a pig wouldn't dodge. Ha ha ha. Far from being offended, Shursway laughed heartily. Ruri, I knew you were an excellent shinobi who values comrades. As they spoke, a few shinobi from the same village approached. They were the other members of Team 9, Muta Aburame and Minato Namike's three students, Kakashi Senpai, Abito Kuen, Rin Senpai, Shursue greeted them politely. He and Abito, both Uchiha, were close in age and quite familiar with each other. Abito jumped up, giving Shursue a heavy pat on the shoulder, squeezing here and there. You're so strong now and growing fast. All right, I declare you a qualified Uchiha. Kakashi couldn't help but laugh, nodding apologetically at Shursue and shrugging helplessly. Shursue is definitely a qualified Uchiha. I heard he awakened his Sharingan at six. What about you, Abito? How old were you? Oh, right, you haven't awakened yours yet. Kakashi, you. Abito's face turned red. Fine, fine. Since today is sparring day, let's start. Sure, warming up is good. Although 10 seconds is a short warm-up, Kakashi teased. Rin Noera covered her mouth, trying not to laugh. Abito, embarrassed, quickly removed his backpack, taking out eye drops and applying them. Kakashi facebombed. Why are you using eye drops? You're an Uchiha. To prevent sand from getting in, idiot. Abito shouted, lunging at Kakashi. As Yudo was seen as Minato's close aide, his students naturally got along well too. When they had free time, Kakashi and Shursue would spar and exchange jutsus. Despite the age gap, Rin was a medical nin with little combat ability, and both Shursue and Ruri were genuine geniuses with high-level Kekiai Genkai, often holding their own against Kakashi and his team. As Kakashi put it, fighting alongside a dead last like Abito and still winning showed he was stronger than he thought. The four watched Kakashi and Abito's fight, ceasing their chatter. Ruri's eyes lowered slightly. She stood behind her comrades, ensuring no one could see her actions. Boom. In the distance, the spar reached a critical moment. Abito used a great fireball, and the flames exploded in the forest, drawing everyone's attention. Seizing the moment, Ruri swiftly pulled out the eye drops from Abito's bag, adding a black powder into the bottle before flicking it back to its original position. Mission accomplished. This is it. White Zetsu put down the bed and pillow, clapping his hands in satisfaction. Perfect width, not too hard, not too soft, and the pillow is comfortable. Yeah, this is the best place for a patient to recover. He scratched his head and turned to ask, Hey, Madarasama, what's the name of the guy who's going to be staying here soon? It's... Abito, Madara replied slowly, still sitting in his wide chair, sustained by the chakra from the statue behind him. Ah, uh, right, Abito-san, White Setsu exclaimed. It's great to have a new neighbor. When is Abito-san moving in, Madara-sama? Tomorrow. Oh, finally a young man who can move? White Setsu hopped onto the bed, bouncing around energetically. He was particularly lively today. Although his personality was always cheerful and outgoing, it wasn't usually this noisy. Before every mission, he would talk a lot to release some tension, to avoid going crazy from holding it in. Madara Uchiha sighed. It's almost time, be quiet. He raised his hand and dug out his left eye with a popping sound. Due to excessive consumption of life force, Madara's body looked like a scarecrow stuffed with straw, with hardly any blood flowing out. White Zetsu skillfully took the Sharingan from Madara and implanted it into his own eye socket. The masked man with a single eye, 
who had fought fiercely with Miko's corpse, appeared once again in the dark underground. In youth, one could conquer the world with strength. But in old age, when the body is frail and only able to linger underground, one must use intelligence to solve problems. Madara Uchiha was no exception. A few days ago, White Zetsu had borrowed Madara's Sharingan to trouble Miko, not as a meaningless move. In the intense battle, the girl's corpse's clothes were torn, revealing black rods. Others might not know what they were, but Madara did. Combining this information, many things could be analyzed. The moon god is someone with sage eyes, hiding in the shadows, controlling corpses with black rods. He has obtained the powers of Kagaya, Hyuga, and Senju, and can use Inyang release. Since he has Hashirama's cells, he will eventually target the Uchiha, and to rival Hashirama's power, one needs a lot of Uchiha flesh and blood, or, or find Madara Uchiha, Hashirama's rival. Thus, a series of plans formed in Madara's mind. Over the years, even with his physical limitations, Madara had accumulated some trump cards with the help of White Setsu, who could move freely through objects. However, the man known as Madara Uchiha knew that ordinary means would be useless against someone with sage eyes. White Zetsu, even with Madara's Mangekyo Sharingan, was not a match. To solve this problem once and for all, a significant gamble was necessary. Betting everything on the potential arrival of a powerful enemy might seem foolish, but Madara trusted his judgment. He had been through more battles than most shinobi had held kunai. These old warriors from the Warring States period shared a similar quality. Pride, extreme confidence, and a lifelong adherence to their own will. Perhaps they were more deserving of the title shinobi than the new generation. The greatest weapons in the world don't lose their brilliance even after being buried for a long time. It's done. White Zetsu lowered his hand, chakra flowing through the Sharingan, slowly adapting to this new Kekiai Genkai organ. I'm off. Leader Sama, a member of the Akatsuki organization panted, kneeling on the ground. The Kanoha Shinobi, they've invaded. Nagato, with his Rinnegan, had sensed the intrusion through his rain tiger at will technique before his subordinate spoke. 100, 300, 800, 1005. The red-haired young man counted slowly, his expression growing colder. Amige Cure, a battleground of the Third Great Ninja War, held deep grudges against the fire, wind, and earth countries. Learning that the Akatsuki had the Rinnegan and had no intention of reconciling with the surrounding nations made the soft target a thorn in their side. This day was inevitable. But you underestimate these eyes, Nagato murmured, preparing to act, when countless paper sheets flew in, forming the shape of a young woman. Nagato, something's wrong? Conan panted, the cold rain making her purple hair stick to her cheek. The Kanoha Shinobi know where you are. They're heading straight for this tower. We have a traitor in the village. Nagato snorted, turning to smile at his companion. It's all right, Conan. No matter how many enemies there are, I'll protect you and our nation. He raised his hand, the powerful ocular power coursing through him, and instantly vanished from the high tower. The next moment, Nagato appeared in the densest cluster of Kanoha Shinobi. Shinra Tensei, the massive repulsive force exploded, scattering everything around him. Tools, bodies, and techniques could not withstand it for even a second. Buildings collapsed, roads overturned and cracked. In just one move, nearly a hundred enemies were killed. Nagato, with his sage eyes, was fundamentally different from other shinobi. A sage and a human should never be compared. Petty Kanoha, sending its shinobi to die for nothing? Nagato muttered, ready to charge again. But suddenly, a chilling sensation gripped his heart. Conan! Nagato shouted, using repulsive and attractive forces to fly back to the tower. But he was too late. At the top of the tower, the purple-haired woman was nowhere to be seen. In her place was a tall white-haired man, with strange toads on his shoulders, bumpy marks on his face, horizontal pupils, and unique facial markings like a mask. This was Jiraiya in sage mode. Nagato, long time no see. Jiraiya's voice was calm. Conan is fine, she's inside the toad's belly. Release Conan. Nagato's eyes were like those of a demon. Or I'll gut every toad in Mount Mayaboku until I find her. Nagato. Footsteps interrupted their conversation. The reunion ends here, Jiraiya. You should use that woman named Conan wisely. Otherwise, we might not be able to defeat him. A man stepped out of the shadows. 
He wore a spiral-shaped single-eyed mask. The Rinnegan Retrieval Operation begins. Five days ago, on the night of the Raging Fire Festival in the Land of Wind, at the same time that Yudo's attempt to feed Candy failed, in the Land of Rain at the Kanoha camp, Jiraiya frowned and crushed the letter in his hand. Hey Jiraiya, didn't you ask me to send a letter to Sunadeheim? A small toad asked curiously, looking at the man. Why did you tear it up after writing it? For a writer, their mood is reflected in their word. That letter was full of bad vibes. I'd better forget about it. Jiraiya sent the small toad back to Mount Mayaboku and sat alone at the desk, daydreaming. Even though his body had recovered, Jiraiya could still feel a faint pain. Nagato, his once gentle and quiet student, now had the power to crush his bones without emotion. The light in those mysterious Rinnegan eyes was chilling, filled with pain, hatred and anger like a withered flower. Jiraiya, your student will bring unprecedented change to the world. Stability or destruction, you are the one to guide this change. One day, you will be forced to make a significant choice. Twenty years ago, the Toad Sage's prophecy still echoed in his ears. When Jiraiya first saw those Rinnegan eyes, he almost believed that Nagato was the prophesied child. That red-haired boy was wise, powerful, and had eyes that rivaled a sage. Most importantly, he understood pain from experiencing war and longed for peace. However, everything had changed. The once promising savior had become a vengeful avenger filled with inner turmoil. Nagato! Suddenly, a cold, damp wind blew through. Jiraiya's pupils shrank, and chakra surged through his body. With a mere thought, he got ready to use Needle Jizo to protect himself. Truly worthy of one of the Sanin, you have such quick reflexes, Jiraiya turned to face the mysterious man closing the window leisurely. The man wore a peculiar one-eyed mask and a black robe that was completely dry. Without asking unnecessary questions like how did you get in? Jiraiya stood up and slowly approached the masked man. No matter his intentions, trespassing in the Kanoha camp was a death sentence. Even if he had questions, Jiraiya could ask after capturing him. Such loyalty to Kanoha, the masked man said softly. Jiraiya, my target is the leader of the Akatsuki. The tall, white-haired man halted. Nagato, I assume Kanoha dreams of eliminating him, given the Rinnegan is against them? If it's about this, you should talk to Minato. He's the front-line commander. No, Jiraiya. Minato Namikaze is the commander. He would consider casualties and impact, and declaring war on another village requires the Hokage's approval. But you, Jiraiya, you wouldn't hesitate as much. The masked man paused then continued, because if you see the opportunity, you will stop at nothing to kill Nagato Uzumaki, right? I heard you were once teacher and student, but when he broke the four Red Yang formation six months ago, you fought to kill each other without holding back. Truly fitting for teacher and student. Why you turned against each other or why you have such a killing intent toward your former student, I don't care. But this killing intent is the basis of our cooperation. The masked man produced a scroll, placed it on the ground, and gently pushed it towards Jiraiya's feet. Jiraiya, the specifics of our cooperation are all here. Whether to follow through or not is your choice. His body melded with the ground like a candle, disappearing in an instant. Jiraiya didn't stop him or move, standing like a broken clock. One day you will be forced to make a significant choice. Five days later. Sensei, I'm leaving. Minato attached a flying thunder god Kunai to his back and said to Jiraiya, Iwagakure is attacking Kuzagakure in full force. If they capture it, the northern defenses of the land of fire will fall. We must stop them. Sensei, I'll lead a third of our forces to support Kuzagakure. You hold the fort here in the land of rain. Haha, <laughs> you're a veteran. No need for me to nag. Minato waved and left the room. Jiraiya watched Minato's departure, faintly hearing his student's voice. Call Kakashi and the others. I have a mission. He didn't catch the rest, nor did he care to. He remembered clearly. The first line on the scroll from the masked man was, on the night of the fifth day, lead over 3,000 Kanoha Shinobi to attack Amage Cure. Jiraiya had scoffed at the masked man's plan upon first reading it. Minato was the commander. Although Jiraiya could command frontline troops, deceiving Minato was impossible. The plan's first step was already unattainable, but now, Minato had been sent away. Could the masked man influence Iwagakure's decisions? Jiraiya pondered this, 
watching Minato lead the army away. The masked man's influence was more terrifying than expected, but Iwagakure's attack and Minato's departure also confirmed that this cooperation wasn't a scheme led by Nagato. Amigekure didn't have such power. Hours later, as night fell, Jiraiya silently donned his armor, gathered 3,000 Konoha Shinobi, and advanced towards Amigekure. He had made his choice. Compared to the Rinnegan that might destroy the world, the risk he took was nothing. Jiraiya was even mentally prepared that if something went wrong, he would have the Kanoha forces retreat and cover their escape himself. Boom. Boom. Two small puffs of smoke appeared as Fukasaku and Shima materialized on Jiraiya's shoulders. Help me enter sage mode, please. Sorry for the trouble. Jiraiya-chan, you don't look well. Still worried about finding the child of prophecy? I might have found the child of prophecy, Jiraiya said, forcing a smile. But now I'm going to kill him. Ha ha ha. Fukasaku and Shima exchanged a glance, absorbing natural energy without further questions. Soon, Jiraiya's appearance began to change. Small bumps appeared on his skin, unique markings surfaced on his face, and his chakra surged exponentially, transforming into powerful Senjutsu chakra. Sage mode activated. Jiraiya opened his eyes, revealing rectangular pupils. Boom. He burst through the rain, running at the forefront of the Kanoha forces, with no more doubts. The disaster he had planted himself, he would deal with himself. Yudo opened his mouth and spit out the thin needle hidden under his tongue. This habit, developed over the years, was deeply ingrained in his body. He shook his sleepy head and pushed open the window. The sky in the east was already getting light, and the cool dewdrops slid down the window frame, dripping onto the back of his hand. The night was over. Yudo stepped out of his room and leaned against the railing of the corridor, gazing at the Hokage rock in the distance. In the early spring morning, even the air was filled with a slight chill. However, the ninja world was very conducive to plant growth. Even though winter had just ended, the trees were already lush and green. Cold was good for the body. Yudo let the cold wind hit his skin to quickly wake up his well-rested body and nerve. Creak. The door next to him opened, and Tsunade stepped out in a navy blue robe. Despite just waking up, her hair was smooth and not at all frizzy, even adorned with a jade hairpin. Yudo didn't know when it started, but Tsunade began consciously maintaining her appearance in front of her student, always looking beautiful whenever they met. Yudo awake so early, Yes, I'll be training in the back mountain in a while, Yudo replied with a smile. If I don't train for a day, my body will rust. But you also need to make sure to rest, Tsunade said, tossing him a gourd. Drink this to warm up, is this sake? If I don't drink for a day, my body craves it. Ha ha. Yudo laughed, taking a swig before handing the gourd back to the blonde woman. The two of them took turns sipping from the gourd, leaning against the railing and having a small drink in the early spring morning. This won't do, sensei. Drinking like this is a bit boring. What do you suggest? Let's get some snacks to go with the drink. It's early morning and the eateries aren't open yet, Tsunade said, frowning. She suddenly noticed her student's mischievous grin, eyes fixed on her earlobes. If she showed him even a little kindness, he would definitely pounce on her, playing and squeezing her ears. You brat, if you want to swim in the pond, I can throw you in. Sensei, why so violent? There should be harmony between teacher and student, Yudo said, scratching his chin. Suddenly, his eyes lit up. Shizen hasn't woken up yet, right? How about we wake her up by something? Watching her reaction would definitely make the sake taste better. Are you the devil? Tsunade glared at him. What if we damage her eardrums? Let's just catch some bugs and put them in her bed. It's quiet and entertaining. As they were discussing mischievously, an Umbu member suddenly descended from the sky and knelt in the courtyard. Tsunade-sama, Yudo-sama, the Hokage requests your presence at the Hokage building immediately. Yudo knew instantly that this urgency meant the Battle of Canopy Bridge had likely erupted. They quickly put on their standard green Kanoha armor and arrived at the Hokage's office. Anoki is determined to capture Kuzagakure, Hiruzen said as soon as they entered. Yesterday, Minato already led the army to the front lines. A large-scale war is imminent. Although Jiraiya is in Amage Cure, just in case, Yudo, you should go to the front lines as well. Yes, Hokage-sama, Yudo replied, accepting the mission. Hiruzen then turned to Tsunade. 
You've been too idle lately. From today on, you should attend high-level meetings like Yudo. Ah, old man, I've been listening to you argue since I was a kid. I know all the ins and outs. Why waste more time? You know everything? Fine, tell me, how many Uchiha members have died in this war? What did we promise Fugaku to compensate for the Uchiha clan's sacrifices? Who are the candidates for Mizukage in Kirigakure? The daimyo of the Land of Fire is about to visit Kanoha. Do you know his intentions? Hiruzen rattled off a series of questions, and Tsunade couldn't answer a single one, mumbling in response. Tsunade, I won't be Hokage for much longer. You'll soon become a senior advisor and need to take on responsibilities. Hiruzen, clearly feeling his age, rambled on for quite a while. Finally remembering Yudo's mission, he waved them off. Oh right Yudo, the third Hokage added as they were leaving, frowning. The umbu at the front told me Jiraiya led thousands to attack Amage Cure last night. There's no report on the battle's outcome yet. Can you check on him and get me a report? Attack Amage Cure? Yudo was surprised but bowed and left with Tsunade. He found an excuse to go to the back mountain and performed a reverse summoning. In a hidden corner of Shikatsu Forest, Yudo moved a rock to reveal a scroll. This spot was his and Ruri's fixed intelligence exchange point. With Shikatsu Forest, they could transmit items and messages across distances. There were two scrolls, each containing a few lines written in English. The first scroll, the powder made from black receivers, has been put into Uchiha Abido's eye drop. He seems to have dry eye syndrome. Within a day, this powder will spread throughout his body. Before it fully metabolizes, you can easily locate him. The second scroll, Iwagakure is attacking Kuzagakure. The three of us have been assigned to the expedition team. The Battle of Canopy Bridge is about to erupt. Be careful. Oh, and I'm not in Amage Cure, so I can't relay the information sent by Kitsu in time. She's such a model student, Yudo thought, feeling impressed. He moved the stone back and burned the two scrolls. Though he had some doubts, he didn't take Jiraiya's attack on Amage Cure too seriously. With Nagato's hostile attitude towards surrounding villages and the threatening Rinnegan, Getting attacked was inevitable. But without a chakra weapon like a tailed beast, Amage Cure would be hard to conquer. But on the front lines, I need to find a chance to discuss diplomacy with Nagato. Just play along. Without political wisdom, he can't survive among the three great nations. With these thoughts, Yudo left Shikatsu Forest. Tsunade helped him check his armor and wristbands. Shizun, now awake, sleepily went to the kitchen to prepare some bento, which Yudo stored in a sealing scroll before leaving the village gates. This mission was solo support, meant to prevent any top-level enemy attacks, so he had no subordinate. Yudo, lightly equipped, left Kanoha alone. Earth release. Rock dwelling collapse, an Iwagakure shinobi slammed a hand on the ground, causing an explosion of chakra. The cavern shook as massive boulders, the size of houses, began to rain down upon the three young shinobi inside. This is bad. Find an exit quickly, Kakashi yelled, but after only a few steps, he collapsed with a thud. His left eye was covered in layers of bandages. Just a few minutes earlier, this eye had been rendered useless by an enemy. Kakashi, still unused to seeing with only one eye, was struck in a blind spot by a falling rock. Exhausted from the intense battle, he immediately lost consciousness. Before blacking out, he saw someone rushing toward him, and pushing him aside. He didn't know how much time had passed, but Kakashi suddenly opened his eyes to see Rin's tear-streaked face. At the same time, he was met with a horrific sight. Abito lay on the ground, his right side crushed under a massive boulder, blood pooling around him, barely clinging to life. Damn it! Kakashi rushed over, but the boulder both pinned Abito and supported the collapsing cave. With his strength, he couldn't move it. If he used Chidori to break it, the flying debris would shatter Abido's body as well. Save your strength, Kakashi. At the brink of death, Abido, usually seen as the team's weak link, displayed the qualities of an exceptional shinobi. He smiled gently, speaking softly. My right side is completely crushed. I can't feel anything. As he spoke, Abido coughed up blood, clearly suffering from internal injuries caused by the boulder. Damn it. Kakashi knelt on the ground, overwhelming regret filling his heart. He clenched his fist, pounding it against the rock. If I had listened to you and come to save Rin earlier, this wouldn't have happened. 
I'm not fit to be a captain. I'm not fit to be a shinobi. Uh, Kakashi, I just remembered. At that moment, Abito spoke again, still smiling as if it wasn't his body being crushed. When you were promoted to Jonin, Sensei gave you a special kanai, and Rin gave you a medical kit and a good luck charm. I've always thought about what to give you. Now I've finally decided. Don't worry, this gift won't be a burden. I'll give you this Sharingan. No matter what the villagers say, you and your father, the White Fang of Kanoha, are great shinobi. That's what I think. Rin, please, do me a favor and transplant this Sharingan to Kakashi. I'm about to die, Kakashi, but I'll be your eyes, so you can see the future. White Zetsu squatted on the ground, looking up at the rock ceiling. Ah, uh, new neighbor, when did you fall from the sky? Boom. While talking to itself, the rock above shattered, and a blood-covered boy fell through the pre-dug tunnel. White Zetsu quickly caught him and, with a brief glance, winced in pain. His right side is completely destroyed and his left eye is gone. If he dies on the way back, Madara-sama will definitely be angry. Holding a bido, White Setsu ran. At midday. So fast. Yudo stood on a tree branch, carefully sensing the chakra reactions in the distance. He had observed the entire process of Kakashi and Abito rescuing Rin. However, Yudo had no intention of intervening, allowing events to unfold as they did in the original story. He wasn't a saint. For his own purposes, Abito needed to be brought to Madara by White Setsu. Only this way, through sensing the black receivers, could he locate Madara. Sensing Abito's sudden increase in speed, Yudo knew White Setsu had succeeded. He donned his mask and began digging down with brute force. Soon, Yudo's fingers hit hard rock. The lone lion appeared, and he used its cutting power to bore through the rock, descending deeper and deeper. Eventually, the ground beneath him gave way, and he fell a long distance, landing in an underground cavern. Calling it a cavern was an understatement. It was more like a vast underground space. It was about a kilometer high, and the length and breadth seemed endless, shrouded in darkness. If not for Yudo's quick reflexes, grabbing onto an overhanging stalactite with Ryun steel and using the Lone Lion's power to slow his descent, he would have been done for. It's huge. Veins bulged at Yudo's temples as he activated his Byakugan, which granted night vision. He was about to meet Madara, so he wouldn't conserve Chakra at this critical moment. I need to find Madara, fast. If I can, I'll kill him. If not, I'll at least get some of his flesh and blood. With this thought, Yudo sped forward, following the Chakra emitted from the black receivers. The only sound in the silent underground was his footsteps. Though he kept a few kilometers distance from Abito, Yudo didn't make much effort to hide himself. He wasn't good at stealth, and Madara, who controlled many white setsu, had likely set up several security lines. He might have already been discovered. While running, Yudo prepared for an attack. He didn't believe that Madara would surrender easily. Finally, his run came to an abrupt halt. A figure appeared before Yudo. Clad in a black robe, with his back turned, the figure wasn't particularly tall but felt oddly familiar. In the dim underground, the black-robed figure slowly turned around, revealing his face to Yudo. Red hair, purple eyes with concentric rings, and a rather handsome face marred with cracks. This was the impure world reincarnation of Nagato. During the Fourth Shinobi World War, Madara Uchiha was revived using the impure world reincarnation. Kabuto had attempted to control him with a summoning contract, but Madara had easily broken free using the release technique. The release technique for the impure world reincarnation was simple. Just reverse the hand signs. Madara's trump card could very well include powerful resurrected shinobi. Yudo had been prepared for this possibility. But the sight before him was unexpected. Nagato was dead. Yudo felt a chill run through his body. What had happened? Wait. Could it be that Kitsu is also? No no. This isn't the time to worry about the Senju clone. Thinking it through, if Nagato was dead, then his Rinnegan would have been taken by Madara. Where could it be? There's no way he wouldn't be using them. This was trouble. Nagato? In the dim underground Yudo seemed to sigh. Where is Conan? The red-haired young man remained silent, dust falling from the cracked marks on his face, making a faint rustling sound. It seems your will has been erased. Yudo bit his tongue and placed his hand on the ground. Bang bang. Two corpses in black robes were summoned. 
With only one god's mask left, you don't need it to use it cautiously, wary of Madara's countermeasures. Focused intently, Yudo directed Shinosuk's and Miko's corpses forward. One had faint golden eyes, and the other possessed a petal-shaped Mangekyo Sharingan. Yudo had transplanted the Byakugan of the old man into Shinosuk and the Mangekyo of Kagami into Miko. The lifeless Nagato showed no expression, merely extending a hand towards Yudo. Bansho Tenin, Yudo's feet left the ground, and he was pulled towards Nagato uncontrollably. However, while he couldn't control his body, he could still manipulate Chakra. Buzz, Shinosuk's corpse drew a kunai and dashed towards the impure world reincarnation Nagato. Nagato opened his mouth, spitting out a small fireball. Though only fist-sized, it quickly expanded upon hitting the ground, turning into a sea of flames dozens of meters wide. Fire release. Flaming headhunter. Not far away, Miko's corpse closed her left eye, her right eyes Mangekyo Sharingan staring intently at Shinosuk. Blood vessels bulged menacingly, and her ability activated instantly. Shinosuk's corpse suddenly became almost weightless, his speed surging as he unleashed a sonic boom with just his physical body. Kagami Uchiha's Mangekyo Sharingan, his left eye, now in Madara's possession, had the ability called Ishitori, which increased the weight of whatever it focused on. The right eye, obtained by Yudo in the Moon God Encirclement battle, was transplanted into Miko and had the ability Tamayorabime, which could reduce or even negate the weight of object. With a ninja's explosive power, one could even run on air when their body weight approached zero. Though simple, these two instant cast abilities were deadly when used effectively. Thud. Shinosuk's corpse stabbed the kunai into the abdomen of impure world reincarnation Nagato. The pale golden Byakugan flashed as he released the kunai and struck with his palms, the force shaking the very air. The old man was a rare genius who had touched the threshold of evolving his Kekiai Genkai. His eyes not only allowed him to see certain things but also had the primary function of amplifying chakra. Thanks to these chakra amplifiers, Ryosuke Hyuga could continuously use techniques like Extreme Heaven, killing enemies from kilometers away with a chakra palm. Shinra Tensei, sensing danger, impure world reincarnation Nagato clenched his fist. The Bansho Tenin vanished, replaced by a spherical repulsion barrier. From him as the center, the surrounding hundred meters of earth and stone were blasted away, even extinguishing the flames he had released. The dark underground world seemed to rise like a sun, with Shinosuk and Miko being thrown far away. At this moment, Yudo finally began to act, timing it perfectly as the Shinra Tensei ended. He used the body flicker technique to appear before impure world reincarnation Nagato. Rest for a while, Nagato. The caster of today's technique will die, and you will find peace. Yudo murmured softly, extending his hands to tear off Nagato's head with his chakra-enhanced strength. Unfortunately, his arms stopped halfway. Heavy. Too heavy. Yudo felt like he was lifting a mountain rather than his arms. In his Byakugan vision, a man with a single-eyed mask appeared, also possessing a petal-shaped Mangekyo Sharingan. Damn Uchiha. Yudo grunted, controlling Miko's corpse to use her ability on him, restoring his arm's normal weight, and leaped away before Nagato could counterattack. The three Hyuga members stood together. Yudo regulated his breathing, preparing for the next round of attacks. After their initial exchange, White Zetsu emerged from hiding, nonchalantly standing beside Nagato. As expected, the earlier encounter was a probing attack led by Madara. But now, it's three against two. The advantage is still mine. Thinking this, Yudo glanced at Nagato's abdominal wound. Still healing, even in an impure world reincarnation state, movement would be affected. Quickly and decisively. Squinting, Yudo activated the Tamayorabim on himself. His right hand emitted a thunderous roar, using the lion's fong bite technique without forming the characteristic arm gauntlet, merely splitting the air to reach maximum speed. Rumble. Yudo charged fearlessly in a straight line. White Zetsu continually activated ocular abilities, but Miko's corpse neutralized them all. Nagato raised his hand, but didn't use any ninjutsu. This is the drawback of erasing one's will. To Nagato, White Zetsu was a comrade, so he couldn't use indiscriminate attacks like Shinra Tensei. But against the fierce charge from Yudo, weaker ninjutsu were ineffective. For a moment, 
His mind froze and his movements slowed. In a flash, Yudo reached Nagato. He struck with a palm, using chakra-enhanced strength. At this moment, Nagato gathered chakra to release Shinra Tensei, but Yudo didn't retreat. Confident in his hands, he believed he could twist Nagato's head off, even if it meant getting injured. The two experts clashed and separated in an instant. Splash, blood spurted everywhere. A kunai pierced through Yudo's left arm, maintaining its speed even after passing through, caught by a sudden figure. The figure then casually sliced Yudo's throat. So fast? The thought crossed Yudo's mind as he leaned back. The kunai grazed his windpipe, cutting out flesh. Fortunately, he had always been on guard, instinctively stepping back, avoiding decapitation. Shinosuke's corpse arrived just in time to catch Yudo, both crashing into the rock wall, creating spiderweb-like crack. Creation Rebirth Yudo formed a hand seal with difficulty, rapidly healing his wounds. Bones and his windpipe regenerated. He exhaled deeply, looking at the kunai-wielding figure. Silver hair tied in a ponytail, a red triangular armband on his left shoulder, a face marked with dirt and cracks, just like Nagato's. He also had the Rinnegan. But unlike Nagato, these eyes seemed more alive, clearly not a product of impure world reincarnation. An impure world reincarnation body with transplanted Rinnegan, a work of Madara, no doubt. It's Sakomo Hataki. Nagato, no wonder you were killed. Yudo wiped the blood from his clothes, stood up, and breathed heavily. Now, it's three on three. Eh. White Setsu placed the dying Abito on the bed and suddenly froze. Turning around, he said, Madara-sama, that guy called Moon God, suddenly recovered. To what extent was the injury? Madara asked, his head lowered. The Rinnegan he had retrieved was transplanted into the impure world reincarnation form of White Fand. Without the left eye, he couldn't see, and his world was an endless void. However, the darkness that would drive ordinary people insane didn't stir even the slightest ripple in the heart of the withered old man. Why you ask? The name Madara Uchiha is the answer. His throat was slashed by Sakumo, White Zetsu said, while simultaneously transplanting the prepared body tissue into a beto. The trachea was definitely severed. That blood and the sound from his lungs couldn't be faked. But within a second, he recovered. Mystical palm technique. Impossible. The mystical palm technique can't achieve that level of healing, Madara responded softly. It's more like Hashirama's regeneration ability. There are still talents in the shinobi world capable of developing such jutsu. He paused, his brows slightly furrowing. I remember last year, when Saratobi Sprat incited a clash between Kumo and Kirigakure, someone used a similar technique. Ah, are you talking about Yudo Hyuga? He's Tsunade's disciple. During that war, he used a forbidden jutsu developed by his teacher. It's called Creation Rebirth, I think. Creation Rebirth, huh? Speaking of which, many reports indicate that Moon God indeed fights with deeply rooted gentle fist techniques. Madara, you don't think that Moon God is. There's no need to conclude now. He will reveal more of his true abilities, Madara said, then fell silent for a moment. Suddenly, he laughed, his voice unexpectedly filled with a strange joy. A branch member of the Hyuga clan, showing such resolve, we can't hold back any longer. Yudo coughed up blood from his trachea, his throat finally feeling somewhat better. In the original world of his previous life, there was a minor detail. After the Five Kage Summit, the then Kazakage Gara planned to relay the summit's results to trustworthy shinobi in Kanoha and mentioned the name Kakashi Hitaki. Anoki's first reaction was, White Fong's son. At that time, the fame of Sharingan Kakashi was widespread across the five great nations. He was already 31 years old, a top-notch warrior in both mind and strength. Yet, in Anoki's mind, Kakashi's biggest label was still White Fong's son. Even when the fire daimyo suggested Kakashi for the sixth Hokage, he instinctively said, Is that White Fong's son? Even after being dead for over 20 years, his reputation remained unforgettable. That was White Fang of Kanoha. The impure world reincarnation body, with its consciousness wiped, would weaken the sensory and reactive abilities of a top-tier warrior. However, Madara had insanely transplanted the Rinnegan into him, making his combat strength undoubtedly higher than it was in life. White Fang, Nagato, and an eyepatch-wearing masked man. 
Such a lineup was quite deadly. Choosing to fight cautiously to avoid revealing his identity was as foolish as swallowing an exploding tag. Yudo was completely trapped in Madara's snare. At the same time, he was drawing ever closer to the aged and weakened Madara Uchiha. At any cost, I need rush through and kill him. If I do that, I can keep my identity secret and obtain the top-tier Uchiha bloodline. A cold light flashed in Yudo's eyes as he lightly tapped his forehead, entering his masked mode. Grasping the golden long blade, the quantity and quality of his chakra surged. The corpses of Shinosuke and Miko trembled slightly, adapting to the new power. 179 seconds remaining. Yudo lightly flicked the blade, and mysterious black patterns appeared on his face under the mask. From now on, he would keep the Ean seal unsealed at all times. With an explosion of repulsive force from his toes, he left a deep pit where he stood and pounced towards the three enemies opposite him. A flash of cold light. As Yudo approached, the impure world reincarnation form of White Fang appeared beside him, still holding the most common kunai in a straightforward thrust. Simple, pure, and concise, with no embellishment. Half-awakened Tensegan. Twin serpent strangulation. Yudo lightly shouted, creating a terrifying force field within three meters around him. This move was aptly used, not only repelling enemies but also countering the Rinnegans Shinra Tensei and Bansho Tenen. However, White Fang did not retreat. The hand holding the kunai collided with Yudo's abdomen, despite the arm being shredded to pieces. An impure world reincarnation body should be used like this. Yudo grunted, under the effect of creation rebirth. His abdominal wound instantly healed. The brief exchange didn't stop his momentum. The moment his skin was restored, he was already in front of Nagato. Sakumo and Nagato's Rinnegan activated simultaneously, with Shinra Tensei pressing down on Yudo from both sides. Twin Serpent Strangulation roared into action. Although it protected the Branch family boy, the massive clash of forces left him immobile. In a critical moment, Shinosuke's corpse raised its hand and punched the air. A feeble eight trigrams. Vacuum palm, but under the heavenly vision of the Byakugan, its power was greatly enhanced. The impure world reincarnation form of White Fang wavered, causing the balance of the Shinra Tensei to falter. Yudo twisted, slipping out like a fish, narrowly avoiding White Setsu's reinforced shuriken attack. Shinosuke and Miko arrived just in time, desperately tangling with White Fang and Nagato. Yudo's legs tensed as he surged forward again. White Zetsu was terrified. In a brief moment, he realized he was the last barrier between the enemy and Madara. That Mangekyo Sharingan's power exploded fully, and Yudo felt his body become as heavy as a thousand pounds, struggling to lift a leg. However, he didn't need to lift his leg now. The blade handle roared, transforming into a golden humanoid, biting the blade and lunging at White Setsu. Swish. The blade pierced from the left eye, destroying the Sharingan and penetrating White Setsu's brain. A flash of cold light, the ordinary kunai appeared once again. Yudo's flawless Byakugan saw clearly. In just a few seconds, White Fang had pinned Shinosuke's corpse to the rock wall and was expressionlessly coming towards him. Miko's corpse was in worse shape, already missing a leg. However, under Yudo's control, the girl still desperately held onto Nagato's arm, bringing him closer. Everything was going as planned. What a pity! The branch family boy murmured, forming a seal. The mutual multiplying explosive tags sewn under Miko's skin were instantly triggered by Yudo's chakra. Boom! Endless explosions roared in the underground world. Tens of thousands of mutual multiplying explosive tags were summoned, multiplying exponentially. In the blink of an eye, they exploded continuously, creating a sea of fire and high temperatures. Bang! Yudo burst out of the sea of fire, with no obstacles ahead. He grinned menacingly. The intense explosion behind turned the rock wall red, with the heat wave and rubble hitting his back, but Yudo paid no attention. He wore a twisted smile, the killing intent in his eyes almost tangible. Yudo rarely showed such an expression. Even on the battlefield or when he made casual threats about taking someone's eyes to his clansmen, he often wore a cheerful smile, almost as if he were attending a wedding. But this time was different. Madara's counterattack was skilled and ruthless, causing him real harm. With Nagato dead, where could he find the materials to make Uzumaki clones? Yudo had gone through great lengths to tie Nagato to his camp, 
not only to add a usable combat power but also to use his cells to create Uzumaki clones. But now, with Nagato dead, the only named Uzumaki clan members left were Kushina, Naruto, and Karen. Karen's quality wasn't high enough. Using her flesh, the Uzumaki clone might not grow to a level that could be devoured. The dignified 7th Hokage Naruto Uzumaki definitely qualified, but he wasn't born yet. Kushina, as the stable Nine Tails Jinchuriki, undoubtedly had a considerable amount of chakra and vitality. He could exploit Minato's trust to lure Kushina into a trap or simply strike when she was pregnant. The flesh of both mother and unborn child would suffice, but, alright, Yudo admitted that sometimes he, as a self-proclaimed villain, indeed couldn't be heartless enough. Aside from the Uzumaki clone issue, he also lost a Mangekyo Sharingan and a main family Byakugan from Miko. The power of the mutually multiplying explosive tags was no joke. Miko was definitely blown to pieces, not even needing a burial. Counting the Mangekyo he just destroyed from the one-eyed masked man, his dream of building a Gundam was temporarily shattered. Amidst the surge of emotions, Yudo's body suddenly paused. Behind him, the severely damaged impure world white fan used the Shinra Tensei. Nagato was too close to Miko's self-destructing body. Even as a reanimated body, it would take a long time to repair. At this critical moment, only White Fan could attack from a distance and hinder Yudo's step. However, Impure World White Fang's body was also severely damaged by the mutually multiplying explosive tags, greatly reducing his combat power and unable to catch up with Yudo. The two exchanged long-distance blows without closing the gap. But even so, Yudo's speed was significantly slowed. He silently calculated the time. To reach Madara's side still required 1 minute and 15 seconds. Hey Madara-sama, is this really okay? We can already hear the sounds of battle. White Setsu, while stitching up Abito's body, looked anxiously at the old man. No need to panic. Madara Uchiha still lowered his head. You take Abito and leave through the secret passage. It's dangerous here. You're not coming with us? Um. As he spoke, the giant ghetto statue began to tremble, excess chakra being transmitted to Madara's body through tubes. He was very old, with all his muscles and chakra pathways degraded, unable to bear this level of chakra. Turbid blood seeped from his skin, dyeing the stone chair crimson. Madara struggled to lift his hand, forming a seal. Even he felt a touch of fate's mercy at this moment. Forty years ago, on the eve of challenging Hashirama, he had casually placed a dark chess piece. These years of being confined underground, Madara had almost forgotten its existence, but now it had become his last trump card. In a few more years, that eye power would have faded too. The timing is just right. Madara forcibly bound the ghetto statue's surging chakra within his body and, using the power of the seal, cast the technique. In the darkness, this old guy from the Warring States period softly uttered a word. Release. Land of grass. On the vast open field, Kanoha and Iwagakure Shinobi were fighting fiercely, blood flowing everywhere, and the ground was littered with severed limbs. For strategic safety, the land of fire had to stop the land of earth from invading Kuzagakure. Fighting on the open plains, with no cover for either side, the battle's intensity was very high. Since the outbreak of this campaign, the death rate had even surpassed that of the Rain Country's meat grinder battlefield. Minato and Anoki, as the leaders of both sides, bore the brunt of the battle. Flying Thunder God and Dust Release were techniques capable of annihilating large numbers of ordinary shinobi. They couldn't allow the other enough time to act and could only desperately engage each other. Behind Kanoha, in a house temporarily built with Earth Release, Kushina rolled up her long red hair, the sweat on her neck soaking her collar. She was extremely busy. As the head of the sealing squad and the known lover of Minato, many Kanoha shinobi viewed her as one of the decisive figures on the battlefield. With Minato and Anoki locked in intense battle, the vice commanders who accompanied the troops was also on the front line. Therefore, in the rear, all emergencies had to be reported to Kushina. Why are there so many wounded on the eastern front? This wound. Lava release? Send a shinobi proficient in water release over. Don't let Iwagakure's shinobi approach the area where Minato is. Be careful of their tricks with Kanai. Have the shinobi skilled in lightning release circle behind Iwagakure and find a way to destroy their earth release fortresses. Fortunately, Kushina was an Uzumaki orphan, 
meticulously trained from a young age, commanding with great order and avoiding fatal mistakes. Seeing Kushina's sweaty face, the ENBU member beside her handed over a towel. The red-haired woman smiled as she took it, even having the leisure to say thank you. But at this moment, an old voice rang in her ears. Release. At the same time, deep within Kushina's body, in the chaotic and hazy space, a giant sphere floated like a miniature planet. The Nine Tails Fox was trapped on it. Fourteen giant pillars pierced through its nine tails, limbs, and abdomen, with chains tightly binding it here. This beast was the Nine Tails. Since being sealed in Mito Uzumaki's body, it had never seen the light of day again. Pain occupied its mind, making the already irritable Nine Tails even more extreme, filled with hatred for everything in the world. Release. At this moment, Madara's voice reached Kushina's ears, transforming into chakra that invaded the ceiling realm, turning into bolts of lightning, nearly tearing open this chaotic cage. Above the Nine Tails head, a massive eye power was suddenly activated. Forty years ago, Madara captured the Nine Tails and fought Hashirama at the Valley of the End. Before that, he specifically placed eye power in the Nine Tails as a hidden move. Forty years later, even though it had weakened significantly, combined with the Ghetto Statue's power, it was enough to break the seal. Damn it, it's Madara! The Nine Tails roared, withdrawing its right claw and breaking the pillars and chains. The ominous chakra completely went berserk. Roar! Outside, Kushina's eyes were bloodshot, her body severely damaged, blood gushing out, and with violent chakra wrapping around her skin, forming a crimson-tailed beast cloak. Ah! Oh! The red-haired woman roared, her face twisted like a demon. The enormous chakra erupted from her, a chakra explosion as powerful as a hundred fireballs exploding simultaneously. A mushroom cloud rose behind Kanoha, and just one strike claimed countless lives. Tailed beasts are lives but also coveted weapons. On the battlefield, both Iwagakure and Kanoha Shinobi simultaneously stopped fighting, staring in shock at this sudden change. Gulp. Losing her senses, Kushina growled lowly, but instead of falling into chaotic slaughter, she exerted force with her feet, wrapped in the tailed beast cloak, and disappeared at super speed, vanishing in the blink of an eye. Raindrops coalesced in the clouds, traversing thousands of meters before falling to the earth. In the relatively short descent, the liquid finally crashed into the steel-clad village. Boom. A powerful repulsion barrier erupted, shattering the raindrop. Jiraiya was sent flying, smashing through a building, his body exposed to the cold rain. However, in sage mode, his bodily functions far surpassed their usual limit. Twisting midair, he landed his feet on the steel wall of the building, his chakra clinging tightly. The use of natural energy had drastically heightened Jiraiya's sensory abilities. In a single breath, he locked onto the enemy's position, raised one hand, and a chakra sphere with a diameter of five meters appeared. Sage Art. Ultra Big Ball Raisingan. The wall shattered as Jiraiya charged back into the building. Nagato extended his arm, stopping the super giant Raisingan. The Fuinjutsu Absorption Seal activated, absorbing the massive chakra sphere entirely. White Zetsu, wearing his monocular mask, seized the opportunity. Dozens of sharp kunai were hurled forward, and the Mangekyo Sharingan's power surged, increasing the kunai's weight dramatically, as though they were dozens of small mountains. Nagato's expression didn't change at all. He merely shook his shoulders, and the skin beneath his clothes fractured and reformed, revealing mechanical cannons. Indiscriminate firepower erupted within the tower, shattering all the kunai. At the same time, Nagato still had the strength to take a step forward, delivering a heavy punch toward Jiraiya. Two great sages, Jiraiya shouted. Fukasaku and Shima, the two toad sages, understood perfectly. The man and two toads puffed out their cheeks simultaneously, and chakra surged. Sage art. Gomen. Fire, wind, and oil, three jutsu were unleashed together, their power multiplying and covering a vast area. Boom boom boom. After the series of explosions, the red-haired young man stood in place. Aside from his scorched sleeves, he was entirely unscathed. So, this is the Rinnegan, White Zetsu said mockingly as he stood beside Jiraiya. Bring out that woman. The trump card must be used at this time. Jiraiya remained silent, his eyes fixed on his once-familiar disciple across from him, saying nothing. 
What's with this sense of teacher-student affection? Oomph. White Setsu sneered, Jiraiya, if we die here, all the Konoha shinobi outside will be doomed. The strong, white-haired man sighed and finally placed his hand on the ground. Conan, who was tightly bound, appeared. Nagato's lips moved, and just as his figure swayed slightly, Jiraiya had already pressed a kunai against Conan's throat. Nagato stopped in his tracks, looking at Jiraiya in disbelief. However, Jiraiya's expression did not waver. He was a man who could give up everything for Konoha. As long as he perceived a threat to the village, Jiraiya could harden his heart and do anything. A shinobi was always synonymous with slaughter and bloodshed. Conan's jaw was dislocated, preventing her from speaking. She could only look at Nagato with tearful eyes, struggling desperately, which only worsened the wounds on her body. What must I do for you to spare Conan? The red-haired young man spoke indifferently, as though resigning to his fate. Nagato, gouge out your eye. Jiraiya said softly, destroy the eye, prove that you are no longer a threat to Konoha. You and Conan can both live. You know I will keep my promise. Jiraiya-sensei, you've fallen too, haven't you? The man I knew would never use such tactics. I am willing to fall into darkness as long as the leaves can be touched by the shadow of fire. I can do anything. Konoha, Konoha, Konoha. Nagato laughed maniacally, almost hysterically. Jiraiya, do you really think only Konoha is just? The entire world must revolve around your village. To the people of Amigekure, you are nothing but demons. You started wars, slaughtered in our homeland, killed my parents, and drove Yahiko to his death. And now, there are 3,000 Konoha shinobi who have followed you in this invasion of Amigekure. Turn around and look. The bastards invading our country are all brought here by you. All that talk about the will of fire, huh? It's just a self-serving excuse wrapped in pretty words. Jiraiya gripped his kanai tightly, remaining silent. A great opportunity. Two figures almost simultaneously charged out from the tower's corners. Simple kanai appeared, and in the narrow space, their speed was almost comparable to the flying thunder god technique. On the other side, thorny vines with vicious barbs roared as the power of wood release exploded, instantly wrapping around Jiraiya's body. The impure world reincarnation of Sakumo Hataki pierced Nagato's lung, while Kitsu temporarily restrained Jiraiya. Well done. Nagato ignored the blood spurting from his body and used Bansho Tenin, dragging Jiraiya toward him. Caught off guard, Jiraiya was pulled into the air. The thorns left deep cuts on his body and tore Fukasaku and Shima from him. Take Conan and go, Nagato shouted. Kitsu didn't hesitate for a moment, picking up Conan and fleeing at full speed. Jiraiya's face turned deathly pale. Too many unexpected events had occurred tonight. Conan, who had been confirmed dead in the report, Sakomo Hataki resurrected by the impure world reincarnation. He didn't have time to think. Instinctively, he was about to chase after Kitsu and save the two toad sages. However, three powerful gravitational forces simultaneously restrained the impure world reincarnation of Sakomo Hataki, White Zetsu, and Jiraiya. I won't let you catch up to Conan, never. Nagato's mouth bubbled with blood, his words slurred, but unlike his body, which was on the brink of collapse, his will was burning at its peak. His chakra poured furiously into his eyes, making even the atmosphere tremble. What will of fire, what world peace, what child of prophecy, Yahiko Konan, from the beginning to the end, my only dream was to protect you too. A snake-like force pulled a rock, dragging Yudo's body forward. As he moved at high speed, he placed an explosive tag on the rock wall. Boom. The explosion caused impure world White Fong's body to slow down again. In just one minute, the two had clashed over a hundred times. Sakumo's speed slowed down while Yudo used the recoil to move faster, creating a distance between them. With the pursuers behind him unable to attack for the moment, Yudo did not relax. Instead, he focused ahead, his killing intent growing. At the edge of his half-awakened Tensegan's vision, the image of an old man calmly sitting beneath a giant statue came into view. Madara Uchiha. Yudo extended his index finger, and the repulsive force gun howled. Bang. In the blink of an eye, the young branch family member was within a hundred meters of Madara. The old man sensed something and suddenly looked up. His eye sockets were empty, his eyelids drooping, and he appeared frail and blind. Yet, Madara remained calm and fearless, 
Sensing the intense killing intent ahead, he even nodded slightly, welcoming the challenge from the young man with an open and honorable demeanor. Getting such magnanimity from him was beyond ordinary comprehension. Die, ghost of Uchiha, Yudo murmured softly, without hesitation, pointing his finger forward. Boom. A vast and ominous chakra suddenly appeared between him and Madara, piercing through the intruder's shoulder. Blood splattered, but the wound healed rapidly. With fox-like long ears, a crimson chakra cloak, six violent tails, and a sinister power that even made inanimate objects tremble. Kushina? Yudo's heart sank. Just as he tried to retreat, Kushina recklessly grabbed the arm that had pierced her shoulder and swung her left fist, clawing at Yudo's chest with her tailed beast claws. The sound of bones breaking was heard as the branch family member's chest bone shattered. While creation rebirth quickly restored it, the intense life force and chakra consumption left Yudo's face pale. Buzz. The Fuenjutsu absorption seal activated in time, and Yudo frantically absorbed Kushina's chakra, despite the backlash from directly absorbing the tailed beast chakra. But as the strongest tailed beast, Kurama's chakra was almost immeasurable. The Fuenjutsu absorption seal couldn't impact the Jinchuriki's movements in the short term. Kushina restrained Yudo's shoulder and pressed him deeper into the underground. At this moment, an ordinary kunai flew at them again. It was Impure World Sakumo, the White Fan. The kunai cut a deep wound on Yudo's back, which would have decapitated him if not for his use of repulsive force to alter its trajectory. Ahead was the rampaging Nine Tails Jinchuriki, and behind was Sakumo, who had transplanted the Rinnegan. Both were top tier combatants of their era. Faced with this massive crisis, Yudo unexpectedly looked up at Madara Uchiha. Then, he nodded slightly, acknowledging the elderly enemy. The rebel caged bird had a spirit comparable to anyone. I've already exposed the explosive tags and creation rebirth. At least here, there's no need to hide my identity. Yudo sighed softly then raised his leg. With repulsive force enhancing it, he used heavenly foot of pain. Rumble. The underground world of rocks collapsed. This powerful taijutsu move forced back the two formidable enemies, creating a gap just enough for Yudo's next move. He bit his hand and then pressed it to the ground. A simple summoning technique caused Madara's eyebrows to knit together. Yudo's chakra was completely absorbed, even creation rebirth couldn't be maintained. The black lines reverted to diamond-shaped marks, nearly invisible. In the masked mode, both the quality and quantity of Yudo's chakra far exceeded ordinary shinobi by hundreds of times. Yet, half of his chakra was instantly drained. Summoning Jutsu, Yudo spoke softly. The next moment the underground world vanished. The colossal outer path statue, the crumbling rock walls, the towering rock dome, all disappeared. They were replaced by soft white flesh walls covered with numerous tongues and teeth. Katsuyu. For the first time, Madara's face became serious. Even though he couldn't see, his perception told him what the enemy had done. Yudo's summoning technique had brought Slug Sage into the underground world. However, this ageless sage's body was so vast that even in the masked mode, Yudo couldn't summon it all. Only part of Slug Sage's mouth was summoned here. Thank you for gracing us with your presence, Katsuyusama. Yudo bowed, touching the soft flesh wall with his finger. He and Slug Sage had worked together for years and understood each other well. At the moment his finger touched the flesh wall, several tentacles emerged, wrapping around Yudo and pulling him deep into Katsuyu's body for protection. Ha 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 ha. Madara suddenly laughed. Katsuyu. So, you want to join the dance too? Before he finished speaking, the sage's attack began. Its tongues and teeth hardened to steel, and the flesh walls continuously squeezed inward, devouring space and oxygen. Sukumo and Kushina bombarded the flesh walls, destroying tons of slug sage's flesh with each hit. But the sage remained unfazed, continuing to tighten its mouth. Slug sage's immortality had flaws but its immense life force was real. Even part of its mouth could replace the underground world in this area, unafraid of pain. In a way, its immortality turned itself into a small world. Now, with Sakumo and Kushina trapped in its mouth, it was hard to turn the tables. 
the mouth squeezed tighter and tighter, reducing the enemy's space and oxygen. This was a top-level sealing technique in the shinobi world, using infinite life force. However, all techniques and beings have flaws. Summoning part of the slug sage's body to fight had its downside. Yudo had only used half of his chakra so he could keep fighting, but once that chakra was depleted, the slug sage would automatically return to the depths of Shikatsu Forest. Boom. The chakra of slug sage depleted, she disappeared, and the statue, shattered rock walls, and gray-black dome reappeared. Sukumo supported himself with a kunai, kneeling on one knee, while the nine tails Jinchuriki guarded Madara. Even with impure world bodies and tailed beast cloaks, they have limit. They cautiously watch their surroundings, ready to protect Madara from a sudden attack. Bang! A hand emerged from the ground, grabbing someone's ankle. Madara realized, but it was too late. Yudo pulled Sakumo underground. Then, his fingers skillfully touched Sakumo's eye socket and gently exerted force to remove the eye. The Rinnegan was in his hands. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.